But now we are here in 2023, and uh, we are connected on all kinds of channels. We are trying to get better and better. We are streaming everywhere. And uh, yeah, if you want to share anything about the event and you want others to see it, please use the hashtag FOSAsia. Um, and if you want uh, us to retweet it or to reshare it on any platform, Mastodon or wherever, uh, please also like made at FOSAsia. We are also on these platforms. Cool. And um, yeah, many are already on the um, Telegram chat. Um, please use this QR code and join the public uh, Telegram chat here to connect with others. I see a lot of people already posting photos. Um, a lot of things going on, so it's a great place uh, to exchange here with the people on site and uh, yeah, just connect. Cool. Um, yeah, so what else is happening? Um, okay, so we all know we're not yet back to after Corona times. Um, still a lot of people can't travel or travel is super expensive. Also, there are um, changes in the industry. Um, some people are changing jobs. Um, actually, we also had a lot of people, they said they can come, they have the funding and so on, and then suddenly they have to um, yeah, look for a new opportunity. Um, so that means still a lot of people want to join, but they cannot join yet um, on site. So we are streaming on a lot of different platforms. Right now, the stream has already started here um, on YouTube. Um, it's streamed on, on Twitter. It's streamed also on um, Asian platforms here, Billy Billy, WeChat, um, Huodong Sing Live, um, also like with the help of our partners um, like Kaiyuan Shi and Segment Fold in China. So pretty cool to connect um, uh, and to keep this running. So who's organizing this event? Of course, it's First Asia, it's the community, um, but we also have like uh, other partners and uh, we're very glad to be back here in the Lifelong Learning Institute um, that is set up by Skills Future SG. So big round of applause to our host and co-organizing partner. Then we have um, also like uh, uh, community projects and uh, other companies on board. Um, for the first time here, already with a very big booth, you saw it on the ground floor, Open Eula and the Open Atom Foundation. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, a few companies that have been engaging for uh, years, for already for some time long-term contributor and long-term partner in MySQL, MySQL, and Oracle. We have a run deck by PagerDuty on board, nice booth with like green printouts on the ground floor. And we have um, only Office here and uh, Google. So thanks to our gold sponsors. And uh, also some new sponsors. We know uh, privacy is a, a big topic, so uh, VPN, um, is a topic, uh, ExpressVPN is uh, providing these services, YDB is here, uh, Grafana Labs with Angel Hack and Macari. Thank you guys for joining the event. Uh, really looking forward to meet you. And we have business partners, uh, you can find them um, in the exhibition and uh, connect with everyone as well as educational partners if you're looking like for um, like changing career or some upgrading of your skills, please uh, check out our partners in the exhibition hall. And of course, last but not least, like a lot of communities, a lot of companies use them. They are here in the exhibition, but also communities um, are in the exhibition presenting their projects themselves. So really excited to have all of you on board. Big round of applause for everyone. Okay, so um, if you're online and if you're watching us through a stream here, uh, then um, also check out the online exhibition. Um, we have um, a virtual exhibitions area where you can check out all these projects. On the left-hand side, just click uh, on exhibition and you will see uh, much more information and con connect with um, the projects and um, companies directly. So what's happening this year here? Um, there's a QR code. You can scan it like to get direct access to the schedule. Um, we have um, many different tracks um, again. Um, actually, this year um, I want to mention like uh, almost like hardware track. It seems like uh, a lot of people are interested in hardware and chips. There's a lot of developments with Risk Five um, because I can see uh, who clicks. Yeah, I'm sorry. Like it's private, uh, private, but like we still want to know what are people are interested in. A lot of people click on on hardware, so pretty cool. Like big strong hardware track, um, but uh, followed also by um, uh, cloud tracks. 
databases, so uh, professional services, that what uh, um, a lot of people are interested in, and that's why we also have like a, um, like quite a lot of space for these topics here in the um, event. Um, security, of course, like it's we have a dedicated security track, even though you find a lot of security topics also on other tracks. I mean, um, everything is related. Um, blockchain and finance, it's a bit less, but like people really looking into the technology, it's interesting. Um, inner source, how to bring open source processes into companies. Um, we have a robotics track here, um, big robotics community in Singapore. Uh, standards, of course, uh, web mobile, and um, yeah, of course, kernel and platform. So it's everything is related, right? We have some um, Linux topics in the cloud and DevOps tracks, like regarding containers, but also like a focus on um, actually Linux and other platforms directly in the platform track. So a lot going on, and um, I hope you also uh, know about our social events in the evening. Uh, already yesterday, we had a workshop, uh, no, a walk, no, not a workshop, yeah. So. We had uh, people walked around and, uh, and had a view in the city. Who, who was there? Who participated? Yeah? Was it good? Did you like it? Yeah? Thumbs up? Okay. Happy faces. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, cool. So a lot is going on. Social event on Friday. And um, um, we also succeeded to make a bit of gear again. And we have t-shirts. Um, so um, actually, a lot of people, as I said, can still not participate. So um, we dedicated 500 T-shirts to send out to online participants. Um, if you're an online participant, um, please post a message, ask a question, um, and then um, share the link with us, and uh, you will enter the lucky draw to win one of those 500 shirts, which we are sending out. Um, just to say um, ahead of time, um, like some postal services, don't operate perfectly, but like in the last year, we achieved to deliver 95%. Uh, sometimes it's a challenge uh, in Asia, but 95% were delivered, and we want to repeat that. Um, people like post their T-shirts later on; they really feel connected, so we're happy to do that. And uh, yeah, not everything is about online. You guys are here. More, pe more, and more people coming in. Um, we have, of course, also shirts here for you. So um, if you contribute to a session, if the speaker says thumbs up, there was a person really like he uh, um, helped me solve a bug or like uh, he asked a good question or some good input, then um, um, you uh, also have the chance to get a T-shirt here on site um, directly at the sessions. Moderators will have the vouchers for you. Cool. So don't miss out the social event Friday evening. Talk to the registration if you need more information. Uh, in the past, we had Indian dance, but you know, uh, Singapore is a diverse um, country with many like different backgrounds. So this year, um, we invited Malay dance. It's also Ramadan at the moment. Um, so after, um, uh, yeah, like after the day when people can eat and can be together happily, like a nice Malay traditional dance um, fits in very well. So that's what we want. Yeah, karaoke, uh, photo booth. Yeah, just join us for the social event, get the information at the registration. Cool. So that's all from me. And um, yeah, I'm interested to hear a bit more about the topic that we have here, um, sustainable world. We had this big topics about um, uh, um, Corona, but also we have climate change. We have a lot of topics and um, it's all the question, how can we make a sustainable world? And I invite Hong Fook, founder of our Force Asia organization here um, on stage to share a bit more about us and her ideas uh, about this topic. Hongfu, please join us. Well, good morning, everyone. So actually, what is the idea? It's already on the slide. I don't have so much more to say. Open source, open technology for sustainability. That's all we want to do during the conference and uh, during the Asia Summit, but I do prepare some notes that I want to, um, to share with you. Um, first of all, uh, once again, welcome to the Asia Summit. Uh, people in the room and also um, our online participants uh, who've been following us uh, on the stream. I want to say hello also to our broadcasting team from, uh, from China. I know that they are watching us right now. I hope that you are all right um, um, over there. I, um, let's say, I remember a year ago when we first started to talk about um, the Voss Asia Summit 2023 within uh, the team. We were so unsure whether we can make it happen again in person. As you know, after COVID, a lot of um, tech conferences uh, no longer 
organized in person. Um, but then I'm very glad that uh, after several like discussion and then a lot of thinking, we once again can have the Post Asia Summit in person here in Singapore. Um, thank you very much for, for coming here today, for being with us today, especially those who travel from outside of Singapore. I understand how difficult it is to travel uh, these days. And yesterday I met someone, um, a few people uh, came to the exhibition uh, a day earlier and they told me that um, that was their first time ever travel outside of, of their country. And some people came from, um, uh, from abroad to Singapore for the first time. So welcome, new uh, newcomers. I'm sure that you would like to come back again to the summit, uh, similar to uh, many uh, return faces that I see here today. Welcome back. You know who you are. Thank you very much for being here. Um, again, um, for those um, so, uh, who are new to the conference, um, this is an annual event. So we've been running the, uh, this event for the past uh, 14 years. And um, the, the reason why we are doing this is the same. So we, we want to gather developers, technologists, and individuals um, who are passionate about open source technology and uh, believe in its potential to transform the world. In the past um, few years, four or five years, we have seen like, so many um, significant challenges, the pandemic, um, has like profound impact on all of us, um, on every aspect of life. And um, I just want to mention uh, again our main developer in 2021, who also never got a chance to travel overseas before he passed away during uh, the pandemic, uh, the main developer of um, Event Yay system. Uh, so, uh, um, <laughs> We just want to take a moment to um, to think of him, uh, Arif Jaman. And uh, beside the pandemic, a lot of uh, other challenges, uh, climate change continues to be a pressing concern that affects all of us in the region. So we, we can understand it very well. And political polarization, social unrest have also been on the rise with many countries experiencing wars, protests, and civil unrest. Um, so it, overall, like the last few years have been marked by challenges, but also by uh, when we have challenges, uh, we also have more lives. We see um, the potential for positive changes. The theme of Force Asia Summit this year is uh, open technology for a sustainable world, which I believe more important than ever before. Um, open technologies is one way we can have to address um, the issue that the world is facing right now by enabling um, us to create and share sustainable solutions that benefit everyone. I first started um, to involve in open source back in 2007, and I'm happy that I can continue um, to be engaged and continue to work with all the open source community. Um, open source software and hardware can really create a world where innovation is driven by collaboration and not competition. When we work together, we can achieve great things and create a better world for ourselves and also um, the future generations. Over the next few days, we will have the opportunity to learn from the most talented and innovative people in the open source community. Uh, we will hear from experts from the fields of AI, cloud, cybersecurity, open robotics, kernel, operating system, and many more. Mario already mentioned briefly earlier, we also have workshops where you uh, where you can get hands-on uh, experience, uh, and of course, next to the conference group program, we have um, the exhibition. Yes, uh, I don't know if you noticed already. We have the um, in the center the the photo um, geometry scanner that's been set up just last night, um, and more than forty projects by uh, leading companies in the tech industry and also uh, well-established open-source projects. 
Beside that, um, there's also a few local, very young uh, developers community building blocks. So this is a group of um, local Singaporean students who are really into technology and open source. They are running a series of workshops here uh, tomorrow in the evening as well. Um, we have a um, community coming from the region. We have uh, a false, com false community coming from Korea. Are you here? You guys are here? Yes. So you are over there. So we have community coming from Taiwan. Costco, are you here in the room? No, probably at their booth. Then we have also um, community from uh, from China, uh, of course. Anyone from China here? Yes, Kai Yongshu, I mean, from China. Uh, yes, and of course we have people coming from uh, from Japan. So just like a few regional um, uh, communities, if you want to meet them, uh, I invite you to join the exhibition. Um, finally, um, what I want to say is. Um, as I said, so the message is we are here doing uh, what we always believe in technology, open source technology, collaboration, sharing. Uh, we believe that this is um, the way how can we how we can be a sustainable world. Um, finally, as Melody mentioned, but I just want to say again, without the support of uh, Skill Future SG and Lifelong Learning Institute, it's not uh, been possible. And of course, our sponsors and partners, thank you so much for your commitment, for your support uh, to the Force Asia um, uh, Summit the past um, decade. And uh, thank you all once again for being here. I wish you um, a productive and enjoyable Force Asia Summit. See you later. Thank you very much. Um, so um, our next speaker will be Mr. Marco Antonio Gutierrez. Yeah, Marco, please come over, set yourself up um, while I introduce you. Marco will uh, talk about how open source empowers the robotics world, the robotics middleware framework in uh, Singapore. Um, yeah, let me share a bit about uh, Marco. Marco is a software engineer at uh, Open Robotics. Um, Open Robotics is um, like a community foundation, but also uh, Marco works with companies like uh, um, Intrinsic here in Singapore. And um, he has a PhD uh, from uh, the University of Extremadura in Spain, um, contributed to a number of robotics and AI-related uh, projects like uh, um, Robocomp and uh, the Point Cloud Library or open perception. He's also an organization administrator for um, yeah, Google projects, uh, for example, um, Google Summer of Code. Okay, Marco, I see you already set up. Um, very good. So, yeah, we are good in time, and here we go. Thank you very much for joining. Um, hello. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, first of all, I want to say it's, uh, it's very nice to see everyone in real life here after a few years and I want to I want to give a big thank you to uh, all of you because uh, 2020 showed us that without you this is not possible so a big round of applause for all of you put, for being here okay so um, yeah my name is Marco um, from the open robotics team at intrinsic and I want to show you today um, a story of, of the robotics world I wanted to tell this story for because there, there's a lot of people that don't belong to the robotics world, so they're not aware of, of uh, what's been happening there in the in in, in that industry. And and especially, I want to show how uh, op open source and, and free software was a big enabler, and 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 I think is the main reason that uh, we have been uh, evolving so fast and 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 got us to this point in in the robotics world. Um, so this is a this is a small gif. Uh, it's a big video on YouTube, but this is a small chunk of it of contributions to the to the ROS core, a visualization of the contributions. And I want to stop here to to give a a bit of a, a reflection on open source. I think that uh, humanity uh, grows as we collaborate together. So if we think about anything that that we have, uh, we could have not done it with the, without the help of others, right? From a T-shirt to like a pen or computers, like very any, any, anything, right? And I think uh, through time, uh, we have found different ways of co collaborating together, like 
the um, enterprises, uh, countries, like there's many, many forms of, of collaboration, right? But they still pose boundaries to, to this collaboration. Like if you have an enterprise, you have to collaborate within the enterprise. If you have a country, you're not allowed to collaborate or it's very hard to collaborate with other countries. Many, many uh, of these uh, barriers. And I think FOSS is bringing another dimension to this. So um, when, we, when we bring FOSS to, 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 to humanity, like we are able to break these barriers and, and boost collaboration further from these boundaries. And, and this is a story of how that happened in, in the robotics world and how that helped uh, um, um, really uh, boost the, the development. So there's, there's three main softwares uh, that I want to talk about. So the, the biggest one is ROS, which is the main uh, framework that we use in robotics. Uh, the second one is Gazebo, which is uh, focused in simulation for robotics, uh, because without simulation, robotics would not be possible. And the third one is uh, OpenRMF, which is a multi-robot platform that uh, we're starting to develop, and it's actually getting a big, uh, uh, big traction, and it's very relevant here today because uh, Singapore is actually leading the the adoption and the development of, of this software. All right, so a bit about ROS. So the, 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 the problem with robotics back in the day was that um, in every single lab, uh, so robotics had, had a story of where like it, it was mostly developed on, on robotics labs, institutes research and all that, and then suddenly towards the last few years it's been um, moving towards the um, industry, right? So there's more industry, there's a bit less uh, research. So at the time, it was mostly research labs, and then uh, there was a lot of reinventing the wheel. Like you come up, you, you have to build a robot, you have to start from the scratch, you have to build this component, you have, even, though, even though if your specialty is just perception, so you have to build every single thing from scratch, right? And, and that would lead to a lot of teams just focusing on one part and then not even developing the rest. So there was very, very few research teams that would have like an entire robot function. They would say, no, but I have this, this perception part, then I write my paper and that's all, right? But the robot is never working. So it was very, very hard to get like ready, like a full solution ready, right? So there was this, uh, this uh, I would say company, part company, part research lab uh, called Wiro Garage that was, that was started in uh, Silicon Valley and, and they started uh, this, this uh, PR2 program with this robot, and then they created a software for it that it was called ROS, and then they sent it to a bunch of uh, robotics lab around the world, and then uh, they, they started spreading the, the, the software. It was open source, and then all these research labs started doing the, the um, state-of-the-art research on this, and then this got published online, and then suddenly you could just use the software and then put it on your robot and it will just run. And then you could do your research on top of that, right? So this reinventing the wheel stop, and then we could all share uh, our uh, best contributions and then just improve it on what is our best uh, specialty, right? And then um, after uh, Wheel Garage, the Open Source Robotics Foundation uh, was created to protect the, the uh, the, the software and then took over ROS and, and, and now is still the, the, the owner of, this, of, of these projects. So what is ROS? So ROS gives uh, two, four main um, areas, uh, it provides uh, four main features. Uh, the, the main one is the plumbing, which is the, is the one that everyone thinks when they think about ROS. So the, basically the plumbing is uh, in robotics, we use this this concept of components that talk to each other. So basically, ROS will will be just that framework. You could think about it like as a, a communication framework. So basically, it's that framework that connects your components to each other. They talk to each other, and and they they uh, it allows you to introspect what's going on, to debug, and all that. There's a bunch of tools that you can use. Um, that that includes the introspection tools that I mentioned, but also like visualization. And, and many other tools that are um, uh, built by the community. Uh, and then also you get like capabilities, like for example, you get the navigation 
uh, framework. So you can just, uh, you get a robot and then you put the navigation stack and then it's running. Like you literally, you can get a robot working in one afternoon. Like there's not, nothing else you need to do. Just install NAV2 and get a NAV graph and it's running. So that is very nice. And there's a whole ecosystem of, of, of the community where you can just go to this course, you can, you can go to this community um, events and, and everyone's there uh, talking the same language, uh, uh, ready to help and, and, and ready to collaborate. So it's been more than 10 years uh, of ROS, and this is the initial ROS that was created uh, back at Wheel Garage and all the uh, distributions that we've been having. But because of the change that I mentioned, uh, switching to industry, uh, ROS has become uh, a bit more, like the requirements have become a bit more different and there's more need for um, uh, the product to be ready to market security and all these things. So ROS was rewritten uh, at some point, and now it's ROS2. So these are the, the current releases. Uh, there's a rolling release that is the main one that we use for uh, updating the packages uh, all the time, and then we just freeze it and, and make our, the release out of that. So the next one will be coming in next May, which is not there, is uh, I don't need any. Um, there's many, many, many robots uh, running ROS. Uh, in like autonomous cars, NASA robots. Uh, there's a picture of the defunct uh, Baxter. But if you go to robots.ros.org, you will see uh, an incredible amount of robots that run ROS. Uh, startups, there's, there's many, many, many startups running ROS. A lot of them, uh, there's so many that we don't even know because we, we ROS is MIT li license, so some of the startups won't even say it. But these are some of them um, with some data of, of how they got acquired, how much money they, they managed to, um, to raise and all that. If you go to this, there's also this link that uh, tries to keep track of the robotics companies, um, the, the companies that are using ROS. So how, how, do we, how do we manage this? Like it's incredible, it's an incredible amount of people working together and, and incredible, it's, it's a distributed way so there's many different parts uh, that work. So in robotics, people usually, the problem is so big that people usually specialize on something. So you might be the guy on perception, you might be the guy on navigation, you might be the guy on control, right? So what we do is we have this place called Discourse, where we all, it's basically a forum, we, we just post things there and it's the main way of communicating stuff. And then there's working groups. So usually when you wanna create a working group, you post it on this course, you say, hey, I want to be working on this. And then you just start working on that, um, that thing. And, and, and you start making a meeting and then people start joining. And then you start doing your, your, um, your stuff for us. You create your repos and then share community. And then there's a, more, a bit more structured part on top of that, which is called the technical steering committee, which is uh, there's certain requirements that uh, you need to meet. But once you meet them, you can join. And these are the current companies that are part of the uh, uh, steering committee. And they basically get together and decide uh, what is gonna be the next things to do uh, for each working group. What is the main, the main important things that ROS needs to, to move forward. There's a ROS2 logo at the bottom. That means there's three slots in the, in the tier steering committee uh, for community members. So there's three uh, persons, that, three community members that are elected and they're also part of, of this steering committee. All right, so Gazebo. I wanna talk about the simulation a little bit. I'm not gonna stop too much, but basically Gazebo is a collection of libraries that you can use independently because they have their own value, but when you use them together, they become a robotic simulator. And the reason that it really goes well with ROS and it was meant to be go, uh, uh, working so well with ROS is because you basically can just use the same software in the simulation and in the robot, right? So you talk to the simulation through, uh, um, from ROS and then the same way you talk to the simulation, you can talk to your own robot. You have to change the very minimal changes and then everything should be working. So that saves a lot of time in robotics where uh, hardware problems can be a, a major issue when you're running tests. Uh, these are some of the um, 
distributions from ROS, uh, from Gazebo, and now I'm going to go uh, over the uh, robotics video framework happening here in Singapore. So this framework started as a problem that was happening here at the uh, Changi uh, General Hospital, which is they had uh, one fleet of robots and they wanted to add another one from another vendor. So that brings a lot of problems because the robots don't talk to each other. The robots uh, might have their own needs, like they need a certain line. They cannot share hallways. They cannot share um, host, uh, elevators and, and infrastructure, right? So then they basically called Open Robotics and they said, hey, can you help us build a solution for this and make it open source so everyone in Singapore can benefit from it? And then we can all uh, also collaborate and, and make it freely available. So, what did Open Robotics build? Um, there's a solution now that allows you to uh, manage these robots all together. You can integrate your feed of robots with, um, uh, with RMF, and then you can do task planning and allocation. There's a dashboard where you can select uh, which, uh, which task you need to do, and then robots will be selected to perform the tasks. Um, it, it can manage your fleet traffic, so if there's uh, this uh, problems with the robots that they, they, they find each other in, in, in paths, then it can deconflict this, this, this traffic. Uh, it integrates with the infrastructure, so we have adapters for doors and, uh, and lifts. And the work cells, which are basically dispensers, uh, robots that will, uh, this is an example of uh, dispensing a bottle, a can of Milo to a robot. Um, there's a bunch of tools that came with it, so you get a uh, traffic editor, which is basically a way to design the, the floor um, that allows you to generate a simulation world, and it also allows you to generate the nav graph that you can use for the uh, robot's navigation. Uh, it has the core, which is the one, the, the, the one that takes part on this uh, task allocation, the conflicting traffic, and all that, and it has a dashboard. Uh, this picture is not updated, but it, it, it is uh, something like that where you can uh, basically select uh, what tasks the robots need to do and, and when they, they need to do it. Um, there's many open source assets that have been uh, publicly uh, made publicly available. Uh, so you can find them on uh, appgazebosim.org. These are all the companies in Singapore uh, that are part of this uh, collaboration that are somehow... Uh, also uh, taking part, you can see Changi Airport, GovTech, uh, CGH, uh, many, 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 many uh, people working together. So if you're interested, where to start? There's a bunch of ROS links here if you want to get started with ROS. Uh, same for Gazebo, same for OpenRMF. Uh, basically, you get the website, you get uh, some place to uh, ask questions, and then you get some place to discuss, uh, like usually this course and a bunch of uh, GitHub repos. So there's so many community events. Uh, Roscon is the main one. So we run Roscon once a year. And uh, the last two years it's been online, but uh, we're uh, hoping to get a new one. We did, we did the last year in Japan. Sorry, that was in real life. And, and the next one coming in, in New Orleans. And they, there's also many other events that happen around the world, not only Roscon. Uh, there's the local community events, and I wanted to announce that uh, the ROS Meetup Singapore is back, and we're doing it as part of the uh, robotics track here at Force Asia. So big thanks to Force Asia for helping us uh, run this. And uh, if you guys want to attend, I'll be giving a very, very basic introduction to ROS for everyone that doesn't know anything about ROS and still wants to get started into the um, robotics world. I want to uh, know what is this ROS about. I'll be introduction from zero, and and the rest, uh, will, so you can attend the rest and still understand um, what's going on. And yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I hope I hope that was. Uh, let's let's try to make some better robots than this. Yeah, thank you. Okay, cool. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, there will be the Ross. Um, uh, there will be Ross sessions, and I think people can ask questions then, and um, you will go into detail then.
at the specific sessions. Cool. So um, the next uh, session is coming up, and um, I would like to ask uh, Norbert uh, and Alexander to come on stage, set up their presentation, please. And um, yeah, I will already start to introduce you guys. Um, so uh, the title of your session is The Bumpy Road of Bringing a Machine Learning Model from Development to Production, Part 1, Search, Re-Ranking, um, and Development of a Model. So um, there will be Part 2. Uh -huh. That's uh, uh, what I get. Yeah, OK. It's, it is working. Uh, is the um, uh, clicker working? Yeah? OK, great. Nice. So Norbert, uh, we also know each other already for some time, uh, met uh, uh, on different continents. And uh, yeah, you've also been uh, stuck in one place uh, for uh, yeah, too long time. And uh, um, but you are back on the road. You've been to the US, you've been to Europe, you've been back here. And, uh, um, and you, you have quite interesting hobbies, yeah? I know one time uh, um, you told me that uh, you had to choose, either become a mathematics professor or a mountain guide, yeah? So this is the uh, thing. And so I ended up a school engineer, right? <laughs> yeah, you see? So um, very interesting and uh, yeah, nice to meet you again here at the event. And um, you're working now for um, Mercari, um, uh, who is maybe not based in Japan, um, doesn't always know uh, about Mercari. Um, I will introduce a bit about it. We will introduce it in a moment. Okay, uh, great. So it's it's definitely an e-commerce platform. Um, and uh, yeah, and you have brought your colleague with you, um, Alexander Zagnyotov. Yeah, is that a ah, thumbs up? Thank you very much. So more or less uh, right. And um, Alex, um, you also uh, arrived yesterday here in Singapore. You're um, based in Japan as well. Yeah. How's your Japanese? Huh? How is your Japanese? Very bad. Very, very level. Very basic level. Okay. So, so then you can there is still like, have probably a few years to practice, but like uh, now you're here in Singapore, it's easy. We, we speak English, so very good. And um, you create value by using data and technology to drive business decisions. So it seems like you really focus on business. That's uh, great. And you worked previously at ThoughtWorks, um, a German company, um, also like uh, has offices here in um, Singapore. And you worked at uh, Box Inc. And um, yeah, great to have you here now with Macari. Welcome, both of you. And we're looking forward to your presentation. Thanks for your introduction, uh, Mario. Yeah, um, thanks for, first uh, to the organizers uh, to organize for Asia in person again. Big thanks to Omfuk and the whole team. I'm very happy after four years to be, four years to be back. Um, for most of the time, we were not allowed to leave Japan. Uh, well, actually, we were allowed to leave Japan, but we, but we were not allowed to enter it again. So that wasn't really an option for us. Um, so I'm quite happy to be here. Um, we are talking. So this is on the AI track. So it will be a bit less um, about open source, but actually I think there's one reason, because open source is so permeating to the whole industry, that you don't have to talk about it. All, every, every work we do in AI, everyone uses AI libraries nowadays, right? That is the, the big uh, advantage. So what um, Mario already said, we have two talks here. This one is about uh, the AI part, but don't worry, we don't have a lot of mathematics slides on it, so don't run away. Um, this, we have a second part on the ML ops, DevOps part, and how to get an AI system running in a yeah, rather big environment, you will see. Okay, so what we will do, we'll go over some um, introducing ourselves quick, then about what Mercury is, because I guess most of you don't know about it, uh, the state of search in Mercury, and then a bit of technical stuff about how to improve uh, search results and learning to rank and then key takeaways. So let us start with the introduction. So Alexander here, um, he joined Mercury like two years ago, a bit more than two. He has um, a huge experience in, in all kinds of um, famous places. Actually, he pulled me into Mercury because he moved very close to the place I live in Japan. We call it the, the Inakaku group because we are living on the other side, um, not in Tokyo. And so he is, yeah, he, thanks to him, I joined Mercury a bit later. This photo is uh, a, a, sent, a friend of, as a colleague sent me. Um, while I was complaining about doing Google Slides, because I'm an old style guy, I use LaTeX and produce PDF, and he said, Norbert, this is how I imagine you when you complain about Google Slides. Yeah. I thought that is quite fitting. 
Um, okay, so first about Mercury. So that is actually, it was nice that, that Hong Fu brought up sustainability because actually Mercury was founded out of one reason uh, with the idea to create something which is called within the Mercury speech a circular economy. It's about reusing and trying to be more sustainable. That was the original idea of the founder 10 years ago. So it was founded 10 years ago. It, we have now offices in the UK and in the US. Um, it's at the core, we have lots of other businesses going on. At the core is a client to client. So people sell their stuff and to other users. Very easy. Um, and of course, if you look at, so you see here, this is more or less how the application looks now. Sorry, it is all in Japanese uh, because, well, it's only Japanese market. There is a Mercury a US application is a bit different, but since we are from Japanese, yeah, you have to be with that. Um, so the main way to interact with the application is via search, right? You're searching for stuff. To, so I often buy stuff stuff from my daughter, like ski boots and this kind of stuff. I mean, that have been used once or twice, I don't mind. Um, so this core functionality is provided by Elasticsearch, another open source, big open source project. Um, I guess most people in, who have a bit an idea have heard about Elasticsearch. Elasticsearch provides already an excellent uh, way to uh, document retrieval and yeah. We, that is what the basic use. So a bit of the numbers we are having here. So we have about 150 billion yen. That's about 1 billion US dollar per year as net sales, uh, 20 million months, monthly users, uh, hundreds of millions of active listing and that you get an idea about. So we had thousands and thousands of search requests per second. So that is the dimension we are, we are speaking about here. And so when Alex joined in April 21, the state of search was just basic, we just throw the search query with a bit of tricks at Elasticsearch and get results back. And that is then displayed to the user, right? Okay, that works. Actually, it works quite nicely, but I mean, there can be improvements, right? And if you're in, the, in this industry and in the area about yeah, search and search improvements, then uh, there are a lot of techniques to improve search results with machine learning. So what we were trying to build up on this regular text-based retrieval, uh, Elasticsearch doesn't do anything special. It's just you throw it tokens, whatever this is, so single words at it, and it retrieves the best matching document. That quite works quite nicely. But well, what we wanted to go better than that, uh, get over this, and that is called re-ranking. So looking into what is the state of the art of re-ranking. I will talk about shortly what re-ranking is, so don't worry. And also how we can be improved over time over this, right? This is not, uh, this is not like a process is once done and then, okay, we finished, uh, would be nice, uh, but there are always improvements permanently. So what is really ranking in a simple image? Like that is a search result, uh, searching for spots is like training trousers for <laughs> in Japanese. And what you actually want is that the more relevant stuff, right, the more the, those items that have a higher probability to be sold are higher up in the list, right? I mean, because, well, at the end, we, if an item that could be bought by a user is on the sixth search page, he will probably not find them. So it's better to move them up. This is, this is what real ranking is doing, basically. So in more abstracting so this is what you get from the search from elastic search from your basic text search and what you want to do is to increase the relevance right you want listing queue is more relevant to the user who is currently searching so that's all about well, well what is the reason well it's of course well increase uh, money right i mean we want to sell more but we want that more people use the platform so that's somehow what we are aiming at um so the, the basic setup it was all done. So we have the Mercury application here that's at the center and we have the, the index with the elastic search that was all already here in 21. That was our basic setup. And the aim was how can we improve on top of this by just throwing in something that takes the results from elastic search and then just reorders them in some way using machine learning. So that is that is was was developed over the let's say last two years. Well, it is in. Um, yeah, 
And I think here I pass over to. Ah, you have your own mic. Huh? Hello, hello. Want to? I don't know how do I use it. Huh? I just press it. Okay. I... Yeah. Thank you. So I will try to cover Robert Norbert. First of all, thank you. I will try to cover the ML side of things, and just to clarify what uh, Norbert has said previously. The later uh, versions of Elasticsearch are fairly flexible. You can uh, incorporate some ML models and to do fun stuff uh, during indexing time, for example, natural language processing. But it's rather limited when you want to integrate uh, other signals that would add personalization to the search results, for example, user activity or something, something else. So that's the previous architecture diagram. <laughs> Uh, so this, I will get back to this. This is a pretty common setup, overly, overly, super, overly simplified from a very high level. You have the first uh, phase, which is where you're recalling results from the index, solar, elastic search, something else. And then you have the other thing, which takes the results from the first phase and uh, integrates some other signals that add uh, personalization. For example, a recommendation system often work like that when you, if you use Amazon or use Netflix, uh, that's how recommendation algorithms work. Uh, they add more signals to the search results when they, or recommendation list when they recommend you stuff. Uh, for example, what you did yesterday, what you did in the past, your browsing history, what are the users in your area, your age, your, your, with your interest doing. Um, right. Uh, da, da, da. So, we decided that yes, we need some sort of a machine learning approach, but what is that machine learning approach? So, there is uh, an area in information retrieval field which is called learning to rank, which is basically a set of algorithms uh, in which are supervised machine learning algorithms, uh, which help you to apply machine learning techniques uh, to add some sort of relevance aspect to the search result, relevance as it pertains to the user that's browsing or searching. So, uh, so how to choose the algorithms, how to apply it. So there are many uh, LTR al algorithms available and luckily for us, there are open source frameworks that already provide implementation of these algorithms. So you don't have to write them from scratch. And uh, the way those algorithms work is they approach the ranking problem differently. For example, there are algorithms that uh, mm, uh, consider documents independently uh, of each other, uh, how, it, how those documents are relevant to the query, there are, which is called pointwise. There's the pairwise approach where documents compare to, uh, in pairs and the listwise approach. So you have the whole result set returned from the first phase of trivial and all that, uh, all those documents together uh, evaluated in terms of the relevancy. Right, so we went with the TensorFlow ranking framework, which is the TensorFlow module, which, si which sits on top of the TensorFlow core. And the reason being is because Mercari is rather maybe TensorFlow oriented, so it was kind of more natural for us to choose this framework. But to note, uh, this is not the only framework out there. We just ran with it and decided to give it a go. It's backed up by Google. So there is some uh, activity around uh, on GitHub around that. So we decided, let's check it out. Right, uh, so, so yeah, um, first of all, so how to start? So we took an uh, authoritative approach. We uh, create a simple model uh, by choosing a, a set of simple features. And uh, we were hoping to utterly, iteratively progress uh, and see how our efforts help the search relevance at Mercari. Now, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we use the supervised machine learning approach where we, we need to label our data. So how do we label uh, the data and what is the label signal? So the most obvious one is click because when you search for something and you want to preview it or you show interest, you make a click. 
but um, there is a problem with that. Clicks are noisy because human behavior is that, that human users just click on stuff. And it doesn't mean that click means uh, something is relevant. And the opposite is also true. It doesn't mean that when there is no click, it doesn't mean that uh, the item that was not clicked on is not relevant. Also, clicks are biased. Normally, human users tend to click uh, at the to, on the top results more than they would click at the bottom results. So, for example, if you search for monkeys, if you like monkeys, and you get back 120 items of various documents that speak about monkeys, normally you would see majority of the clicks, let's say, top 20, 30 results, which means um, uh, if you have relevant results at the bottom, they would never get clicked on because the, most of the clicks are at the top, uh, which means when you generate a data set for machine learning, um, the labels would be kind of biased, which uh, leads to problems like uh, position bias and then selection bias in the data set, where you have this loop where you constantly retrain your models on the biased label, uh, biasly labeled data set. Also, it depends on your application business domain, clicks may not be a good enough signal. For example, it may be a good signal in web search. For example, uh, when you search something and you Google present your search results and user clicked on a given search result, it can be considered a relevant result. But in a C2C marketplace, uh, clicks may not always lead to a purchase. So users click and preview a lot, but doesn't mean that what they click on, they would purchase. So when we label the data, simple click, uh, will not be good enough. So we need some sort of other signals that would help us to teach the model, to teach the machine learning algorithm, what is the, how the model should learn. Right, so as I mentioned, uh, clicks are binary labels, which means it's either clicked or not, or relevant or not relevant, this is not good enough. So we adopted approach to create graded relevance labels, which means we incorporate other business events when we compute what should be the label. For example, if user clicked on something, uh, started, made a comment or liked an item, started a purchase process and then purchased, it means uh, this user event behavior journey with the application, it can be a good label. So what the, our approach is not novel, and like other companies uh, approach this more or less the same way. Uh, so, so depending on the business domain, you have to adopt your labeling strategy. Also, <clears throat> of course, uh, as a general uh, statement in machine learning, uh, what, you, what data you give to a machine learning algorithm, you will get the output accordingly. So uh, it's to have uh, features, to have good uh, features, of course, it's very, very essential. So apart from the um, um, deciding what should be our label, we also experimented with a number of different features uh, as we were trying to train model. <clears throat> So uh, to touch a little bit about the metrics and uh, what I said earlier about business domain, there are a set of uh, very common uh, metrics in information retrieval uh, domain, which is which called NDCG, normalized discounted cumulative gain. It's a metric that um, calculates the precision of your relevance uh, applying uh, behavior which means the higher the NDCG score, it means uh, users see uh, results that are more relevant to them, which means they would click higher on a uh, search results, which is what we want. But a higher NDCG score or any other metric does not mean that the company is actually making more money. So for, in terms of the numbers, you may see higher NDCG score, but uh, sales went down. All right, now we're back to you. And, uh, and the key takeaways. Okay, um, thanks a lot for the, the
the details. I hope you weren't overwhelmed by the, the mathematics. Well, it wasn't that much, at least from my side. So a few of the key takeaways that if you want to implement something similar, right? It is not, we, have, we are not a big team. We could pull this off in short time for a large scale company. So they're using just basic off the shelf open source technologies you can do. Here are a few hints you should take care if you want to look into this. The first is, well, as already mentioned, bad data in, bad data, bad uh, output. Um, you have to need good structured data and proper uh, engineered features. That is actually the most difficult part. This has nothing to do with software. This has with looking at your users, what, what they are doing and what could be relevant. Cleaning your data, of course, um, it's necessary. And uh, invest a lot of time in quality data labeling. It's, um, it sounds crazy. We, as you mentioned before, we have 20 million monthly users. Uh, how many searches per second? Of course, you cannot manually label that. That is not possible anymore. So you have to think about good indicators for what could be a sign that the user is engaged, interested in a certain. That is the, that is the main thing you have to do if you want to set up a good AI system. Um, then keep an eye on NDCG. So NDCG is used everywhere, right, for search results, but we have seen it again and again. If you actually test stuff, uh, business KPIs, so your actual company or engagement, whatever, does not really go along always the NDCG. So things have to be careful a bit. Um, so, yeah, the general structure is, yeah, very general wisdom structured in. Um, so for the feature engineering here, it's like, did, can you, I mean, if it's, if it's possible, you're all, it's good to include into the user interface something that user can give you feedback. That's the optimal stuff, yeah? That was not a good search page. That was not interesting or that was interesting. Even if you get very few of them, they will help you to improve your search results. That is something that unfortunately is very hard to do um, because lots of people get annoyed uh, if it's done badly. And so, yeah, one has to be careful. Um, cleaning your data, I mentioned already, bad data in, bad data out, bad data out. So the same happened with extreme outliers. So you won't believe what humans are able to do. So we have examples of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of clicks on items in, uh, in succession by humans. Um, we are very surprised what, what some of our users are doing. Um, so that means you have to actually create your data in a, in a good way. Uh, good data labeling. So as I said, this is something where you can actually iterate. So it's not that you have to come up with a genius solution for all your problems in the first step. We never did this. We started with binary, very trivial labels, and then improved incrementally, right? So this is what we call graded level. So this, like when liked or when commented, so we give it a certain graded relevance level. And this is a way how you can start quickly off with a nice off-the-shelf system to, to provide uh, re-ranking stuff. Um, yeah, I mentioned this already, the NTGT blind side. So it doesn't mean if the NTGT value is good that you get really a serious improvement. Just be careful for that. Yes? So a little bit more on the blind side, uh, in terms of the number itself, the metric might be high, but if your first stage retrieval, your index gives you absolutely horrible results as it matches the query to the documents which are indexed. So in terms of the NDCG, it may be high, but the results still not relevant to the user because you, you could have just ranked poor results. Yeah. So your metric goes up, but your users are still unhappy. So that's where the blind side is. Don't just look at the number and think you solved all, or your, yeah. your element solution is working great. Okay, uh, last but not least, so this is, this is an open problem. And there, are, there are lots of conferences only related to search in AI. Uh, there are a lot of things we can do. Unfortunately, we are running out of time. I just show you the slides. A few ideas one could implement. I don't, I don't say start with that if you want to implement something similar start with something simple, but there are a lot of things what is now, let's say, the apex of technology or what most people are using, then you can progress to this. Okay, uh, time is over. Thanks for your interest here. Um, we are open for, I think, one or two short questions, I guess, um, if there are.
But no questions then. Thanks everyone for that. Oh, wait, sorry, there was one. I didn't see. Uh, actually, um, the second talk by the two here sitting here, and we go in more details, uh, ML ops. Um, so we split this because we don't have that much time. The, we have a second talk on Saturday, uh, which goes into uh, ML ops and implementing and discussing. So, but it's all off the shelf stuff, I would say, um, nothing specific. Thanks. Yes, Marco. Yes, because they then actually purchase something. Yes. Uh, yeah, so uh, Marco, the question was, I will just repeat it for everyone else. Uh, we mentioned that there is a very weird user behavior and? Actual user or robots. So y yes, of course, this is a huge problem. Rob uh, bots, uh, we all know that 90% of the traffic of the internet is consists of bots. Um, we have indication that they make purchases. So that could still be a bot, but yeah, so hard to see. We identified like very consistent clicking behavior pattern from our data. It doesn't look like it was a human. So, and there is like huge amount of clicks. So there is certain indications which will help you to identify the bots and you need to clean that out when you prepare your training data set. Okay, I think time is out. Thanks a lot for your attention and um, yeah. We, are, we have a sponsor table if you have questions, we are around. Awesome, so I have a practical question. Your, your second session, um, can people bring their computer and then uh, also like you do some hands-on with them? Or is it possible?
Well, the thing is, like, uh, we just talked about AI, and uh, I believe you also have a PhD in AI from Nanjiang Polytechnic here. That's right, yeah. So, yeah, really great to have you on board, and um, you uh, work a lot with communities um, to bring them uh, uh, together with companies, with projects, and we hear more about this now, so what should I talk more? That's what your talk is about, well, about your work, so welcome to you. Thank, Thank you very much Thank for you. joining us. Thank you. So, hello everyone, I'm Jackie, and I'm based in Singapore. I, I understand that there's a lot of you who flew in over here, so a big welcome to all of you to Sunnyside Singapore. And I hope that uh, you all had a chance to eat some of our finest food in the hawker centers around. But don't worry, if you need more recommendations, feel free to swing by the booth that we have. And I will tell you about all the greatest and yummiest food to eat. Right? So, um, I, I'm from Angel Hack, so I'll just talk a bit about what Angel Hack is in a bit. And, okay, so today I'm going to talk about how we can leverage uh, OSS to engage, educate, and empower developers. It's quite a mouthful, and I feel, feel like I've uh, bitten more than I could chew. But it's okay, let's see what we can do in the next 15 minutes. Okay, anyways. Um, so, before I go, okay, uh, this, is, this is what my team needs me to say. All right. I might, yeah. They have a knife on my throat right now. So, a little bit about Angel Hack. Uh, you may or may not have heard it. It's quite an old brand. Uh, it's been around for the past 11 years or so, all right? And it is the world's largest and most diverse global uh, developer ecosystem. Uh, we have around uh, close to, in fact, this is kind of like old statistics. We have more than like 300K developers all around the world. And um, as its name suggests, Angel Hack, we started off focusing on hackathons. And to date, we have more than 10,000 projects uh, built on our events. And we have a presence in over 160 countries. And yeah, I hope that some of you might recognize the, the name. Uh, supporting us is a pool of global ambassadors all around the world on campuses. Uh, we, okay, like something that we are, we are, we are trying to start up again. But yeah, we, we, it's very, we are very community focused. And a lot of our events are run uh, quite, quite, I guess, in a, in a uh, do I use the word decentralized manner, but uh, everyone does their own thing, right, within their own community. Okay, um, a little bit about myself. So, okay, that's me right over there. I may or may not look like it. <laughs> uh, and a little bit about myself. I started off as a scientist in biology, and then I, I decided to just combine uh, a bit of AI with my research uh, for my PhD. And um, currently, I'm the head of product in Angel Hack, where I run, uh, where I do research where I ideate and prototype new products and programs to engage developers in communities. Uh, myself, I'm a, I'm a passionate educator, even though that's, even though I'm, my voice is kind of low, right? Um, I started off with an InsurTech uh, startup. So I'm a serial entrepreneur. I'm also an educator. I'm a jackie of all trades. I wear many hats. Uh, I've, in the recent years, I ran a data uh, science edutech company called Uplevel, where we help uh, learners level up, Uplevel. Uh, we chose Uplevel because level up was taken. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> so we, we help them through project-based training and also like apprenticeships. So we work with companies, we put them in, in apprenticeships and help them, you know, get better at what they do. Um, and then, okay, I'm going to skip the blockchain part. I'm not too sure what the ground sentiment is regarding blockchain. Uh, for my work in the startup scene, I um, uh, was a world of 30 under 30, not 30 anymore. Uh, I've spoken on global stage regarding tech and non-technical stuff. Uh, I've led projects in machine learning and both in blockchain. Uh, done a lot of simulation work. And uh, in my free time, I'm an adjunct professor over at NTU. Uh, who does that, right? Like, <laughs> so, so that's kind of like my hobby, teaching. So teaching is in my blood. Uh, I've, well, I've spent many years teaching now, and um, I think only probably Marco recognizes me. Amen. So, okay, I'm not going to talk about what FOSS is exactly, right, because, you know, it would be preaching to the choir. I'm going to show you a couple of memes, which I think feels like the most representative of the, the community, right? And so, um, I don't know, I feel like OSS is a very giving, it has a lot of heart, right? 
Um, it's a lot of thankless work sometimes, I feel. And uh, they get a lot of flight, but this is, this is great. Now, um, also another one of my favorite memes that I see. Okay, not really a meme, but it's a, it's a comic, right? Like, it's... Uh, <laughs> I was telling someone that a lot of modern society wouldn't operate without OSS around. Like, if you take OSS out of the equation, I think society will kind of collapse. I think. I, th I feel. So, um, effort force is for everyone, right? Uh, be for to play, to learn, or to do good. And I'm going to talk a bit about them quite briefly in each. So this is kind of like a breath kind of thing, right? Um, I'm not going to go too in-depth into each part. So let's start off with play. So what does it mean by play, right? Play can mean many things. And here's a question for all of you. So what does ICPC, ICPC, right? The International Collegiate Programming Contest, um, CATIS, uh, and at, at code.jp have in common. So these are, these are what you call uh, online judges, right? So uh, they're very popular in colleges where you, uh, where you set it up, where you set a challenge up, and then the students come in and they work on it. A uh, wonderful thing about these uh, platforms is that it's, it's open source. It's all open source. So if you actually want to run your own uh, contest, right? If you want to run your own challenge within your community, Right, you can always uh, grab the code and then run it within your community. So what I'm trying to say here is that, like, let's say if you want to engage your community, right, uh, you can use such platforms. Because to me, right, uh, when you, okay, so who who here likes challenges? Who here likes to like go for these coding contests? All right, okay, uh, okay, right, it's I don't usually get hands when I ask for it, but I still do it anyway. Um, right, engaging. Community engagement is a tricky thing, and you always need some kind of activities to, to, to kind of like engage them. And yeah, having, having these platforms are wonderful. Um, I mean, I'm wearing the lenses of a community manager, right? So if you have all these activities up, it's a lot easier to uh, keep, them, keep them engaged, keep them entertained, and also keep them upskilled as well, right? Play equals to education. And I think one thing that... Uh, that that's not really stated much is that there's a lot of learning by doing. Like personally, I strongly believe in learning by doing. Um, there's only so much you can do by watching videos and, and reading like tutorials on Medium or like on blogs and whatnot. Um, best part is you can modify it freely for your own community, right? Uh, so I've, yeah, I'm not gonna go down that path. It's like not enough time, right? So, um, how about learn? Actually, I'm going to spend a bit more time on learn part, right? Because uh, do you know that in a, in a kind of like in a computer science program, right, you spend around 8,000 years by the time you're done with your four years. Uh, it's kind of like a rough estimation. The numbers may seem a bit different for uh, some of you. And for a large part of uh, society, right, uh, not everyone gets this number of hours of training, right? Of course, uh, this is based on the usual curriculum in a kind of like a university in a developed country, right? So in, in countries with fewer resources, it's very hard for students to get, uh, or developers to get this number of hours of training, right? So it's actually very easy to get left behind. Uh, let's say if you're a, a developer in a, in, a, in a less equipped university, for example, right? Versus, uh, say, a uh, a student from the National University of Singapore, the differences in number of training can be quite large, right? Um, of course, okay, I, I guess I can explain a bit what goes into this calculation, right? Um, 130 credit hour module, each credit is 10 hours of work per week, you multiply it and you get somewhat close to 8,000 hours. So, um, and this is only for students from uh, CS programs. How about how about mid-career switches? How about those who come into ga game a bit late, right? Uh, this is something that I I've been trying to solve for the past couple of years in my previous uh, startup and like well, I guess in my educational initiatives, right? But um, so that's why I always go back to like using hands-on learning as a way to close the gap between. Uh, 
where you are, where you are, and where you have to be, right? To be kind of like not on par, but to be to have the same kind of experience, right? Uh, as uh, a regular developer who come out of a CS program. So um, I think okay, I just try, I try to keep this as general as possible, right? Because like I wasn't too sure who was in the audience. So for example, this could be streamed online to uh, aspiring aspiring developers out there. So uh, but you know, in case you know, you're a you're a leader in your community or you are mentoring people. There are many things we can do today, actually, to close the gap, and uh, OSS is kind of like the way to go, right? Um, I guess this list gets updated every year, but generally, if you, the, the idea is to have this awareness that, hey, actually, there are a lot of, of these programs out there that you can use. So, I mean, Google Summer of Code is the most famous one, right? I mean, who, who hasn't heard of Summer of Code? Uh, people outside the community, that is. So, um, some of code, one thing you get paired up with in, in open source organizations and then you know you, you get mentored over the summer, right? So but um, if coding isn't your thing, that's also the summer of docu documentation, right? Because documentation is also something very important. Um, this this is also good because on top of training uh, developers, we should also be training a generation of uh, technical writers. Right, technical writers, those who can write and those who can code concurrently. Now, um, if this is also something useful, like for example, good first issue, right? This is what it does is that it kind of like collects the data from all the different uh, projects and identifies the good first issues, right? That beginners can work on. Uh, However, if you're in the web tree space, we also have kind of like the equivalent in the web tree space, right? Like, let's say if you want to work on blockchain projects instead, uh, the, you can also head to places like uh, learnwebtree.xyz, and uh, there's also an equivalent list of projects that you can contribute to. So I'm just gonna like skip, 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 skip. Okay, basically, uh, oh yeah, this kind of goes on what I wanted to say, right? If you're a senior, you should uh, opt to kind of like grab someone mentor I mean it goes both ways right because juniors sh shouldn't be too shy and like reach out to people for mentorship uh, finally do good okay this is another very like fast one right we do good why do we do good because there's the implication that this is bad <laughs> okay uh. so um, in case this in case you're not sure what uh, I'm showing here's a quick TLDR about the what the whole open AI fiasco is about Open AI is supposed to be open, but it's not open. Um, so it's kind of hard, right? Because AI, you, you see in the news, you have a lot of alarmists and everything. I'm just going to like oversimplify it. But the idea is that um, the open source community, they are kind of like fighting back, right? Not fighting, fighting, but they are in response, right? They are working on their own open source versions. Uh, so here you have a crowdsource uh, data set. And then you also have something called ShareGPT where they interact. So this is an extension that you can install in your Chrome browser where you can just use uh, uh, ChatGPT and then upload the conversations you have as training data for. Okay, wait. So, so take note of ShareGPT, right? Now, a uh, quick landscape of how uh, large language models are like in the past three years. Even though there's been a lot of uh, models released, right? Uh, now, these days, we actually focus on the very narrow part of the LLM uh, development. So, I just want to talk briefly about Yama. So, Yama is a model released by Meta uh, or Facebook, right? And Stanford actually took that and uh, used ShareGPT's data to turn uh, Yama, a general purpose LLM, into something more equivalent and similar to ChatGPT called Alpaca. Uh, so I think we'll see a new generation of animal-themed uh, name models. It's cute, right? You, we used to have things like Bert, and then you have Ernie, right? and the Sesame Street characters. Now we'll have animals. I love it. Um, and it's a, it's a constantly developing field, right? And the thing is, like, where do we go next with regards to doing good uh, with open source? I actually don't know. But... But here's a plug. If if you want to do good, um, I, <laughs> and heck, some of my colleagues are laughing right now. 
Uh, we were organizing something uh, called Hack Singapore. It's a pretty large hackathon event. I encourage all of you to give it a try. Um, I believe it's virtual. Virtual? No, it's not virtual. It's, it's, it's the, the, the demo day is in person, right? Uh, but I think it's, you know, it's over a long period of time where you can build stuff to do good. So one of the themes over here is actually doing good. Um, and that's something that we believe in. Uh, on top of that, we, we have uh, things to help developers level up in, uh, on Discord. So two, two major things that we're running right now. One is a monthly code challenge to, again, hands-on uh, hands hands uh, practice right, to get better. This one is data visualization next month algorithms. And um, the other one that we're doing is what we call a content bounty, where we encourage developers to write uh, technical, technical content. So it could be code guides, could be anything. So it's kind of like while you learn, say in this particular case, it's Celo, right? Celo is just a, it's a stable coin. Um, it's a stable coin. Uh, okay, that, that itself is a separate conversation. But um, developers can then learn the Celo ecosystem and then write content about it. Okay, so anyways, uh, call to action. If either of it interests you, please join us on our Discord server and also check out our Hack SG website. Uh, if you can't catch the QR code in time, don't worry. We have a booth set up in the hall. Uh, feel free to swing by to chat. I'll be here all day. And on this note, thank you everyone. Uh, thank you organizers for having me. And yeah, have a good day ahead. Okay, thank you very much. I, I realize you have a lot of uh, animal photos in your presentations, yeah? So I will say, relax. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, I'm Wang Jianmin, you can call me Jimmy. Uh, I worked in uh, uh, SCS, I'm a software engineer. SCS is a leading research institute in China focused on computer sciences. But today I will not talk about some complicated research achievement. Uh, I'm excited to talk about with you, uh, talk about Open Euler. Uh, that uh, I'm very proud of, uh, to be a part of it in the past three years. Uh, I will share. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, I will share with you uh, uh, six stories that I experienced in Open Euler community, and uh, to see how communication play a crucial role on it. That's from uh, beginning. It's December 2019. Uh, the Open Euler team come to Beijing uh, to ISCS to talk about uh, cooperation and uh, the vision of Open Euler. But uh, uh, it's not the 
beautiful vision or some good goal to make me decide to join the community. It's because the resonance of engineer. Uh, you know, as an engineer, uh, especially Linux engineer, when we start the laptop, the first thing we do is not to click mouse or to touch screen. Yeah, my daughter, six years old, she loves to touch the screen, the monitor. And uh, we prefer to use a keyboard to open a console window with pure black background and enter command, right? VI or Emacs. Yeah, so uh, when I see the same action from uh, engineer of OpenEULA, I see, hmm, Pierce, same guy. So mm, I think is this type of resonance to let me enjoy do, doing contribution to OpenEULA and also let us have a better communication in the in the commu community. So OpenEULA is just three years old. Uh, what's the vision of OpenEULA? OpenEULA is want to be a reliable open source operating system that unleashes the vast certified um, computing power for a sustainable future. As we know, we learn from university uh, operating system manage software and uh, hardware resources. It's about uh, 15 years ago when I start to do some research on OS, my teacher uh, Chen Rong uh, told us operating system is uh, an accumulation of historical function. In the past 50 years, uh, we have a huge and uh, rap rapid development uh, uh, about uh, software and uh, uh, hardware uh, from first uh, batching, oh, is batching processing, multitasking to Intel, uh, mobile, and now to the AI, right? Uh, but uh, we think, uh, so the operating system must follow the development. Uh, like the traditional operating system focused on uh, supporting the standardized application on particular hardware device, we think nowadays operating system should play a more important role on uh, new hardware technology of cloud computing, edge computing, uh, embedded computing, and also computing with GPU and NPU to unleash device diversified computing for users. So it's a, I think it's a big goal. It's a huge goal. Uh, a, a lot of things we need to do. First thing we need to do is about architecture. Uh, I think this will be familiar. We have many architecture today uh, in the world. And uh, in OpenEULA, we are not only support more uh, uh, architectures, it will be very glad that we have uh, engineers from CPU manufacturer, like Intel, like Huipeng, to come uh, join this community and uh, work together to integrate the newest feature of uh, CPU into operating system. Open Eula. So uh, this is the one thing uh, we need to do a lot of things about it. But uh, we will later we will have more chances to talk about device-fied computing. But uh, let's talk about another one. It's a very important one. Upstream. Upstream first is the most uh, principal uh, in Open Eula community, and all because uh, upstream project is uh, why Open Eula and the other Linux distribution could ex exist. So we, we pay a lot of attention on relationship with upstream. It uh, involves contribution, uh, integration, and the support. Uh, for example, for contribution, uh, the kernel SIG in OpenEULA, uh, many of them are from Huawei kernel team. They did uh, the most uh, contribution to Linux 5.10 development. And uh, such as Rix 5 Sig, uh, they are my colleagues from ISAS. Uh, they also did uh, a lot of uh, contribution for upstream projects like uh, Mozilla or LLVM to support Risk Five. So uh, this is uh, all engineers are doing uh, such thing. And uh, about integration, one year ago, uh, all maintainers uh, worked together with uh, Linario community and the OpenStack community to finish the integration between OpenStack and OpenEULA. And we also have iOS 6. Yeah, we would like to do more thing about integration between them. And we also want uh, also uh, provide support to upstream community, like provide some machine resources of ARM or under RIS5 to upstream project to, to uh, optimize. 
So this is uh, communication with upstream community. And uh, the fourth story is about uh, uh, communication in this community. Two weeks ago, I was in Tianjin, China. Uh, we have a TC meeting. Uh, we talk. Uh, we have a long talk about uh, what's the next kernel version of next uh, open oil uh, long-term uh, support addition. Uh, it looks like a simple choice, but uh, we need to talk with six from kernel, uh, compiler, or release, and we also have uh, uh, engineers from Intel to talk about their plan, their their thought. And uh, we also have engineers from other distribution, like OpenSUSE and OpenKitty, to provide their uh, suggestion for us. We review our timeline, review our compatibility policy, and the coming feature, and also use us feedback. Uh, it looks like a simple choice, but uh, before we do decide, uh, before we uh, make the decision, the more important is communication, because, because communication make us uh, let uh, everyone know each other's uh, thought, each other's needs, and uh, coordinate our plan, and identify potential issues. So I think communication make this community more reliable and sustainable. sustainable. So uh, based on this community, communication in community, we have many engineer-driven innovative uh, projects uh, around the kernel, around the robotics around uh, 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 such as the development, flexible develop the deployment, and uh, DevOps. And this is, and then we talk about file one. Yeah, uh, file one. Do I have students here? Students, yeah, I think I met uh, some students yesterday in the walking. Yeah, so this is for you. Uh, this is for the students, is our future of open source. Uh, this story from also is from three years ago. Uh, I is exactly in April uh, 2020. Uh, at that time, I stayed in Singapore, and my colleague Chu Sheng and uh, a friend Ma Quan Yi, uh, they were in China. We talk on, in an online meeting. We talk about how to involve more students in open source project. And so we think about the idea of the program of Summer of Code. Uh, so we talk with our friends in some uh, open source project, and they were also positive. So we draft a plan in two days, submit to our boss in SAS uh, and Open Euler. So luckily, uh, at that time, uh, SAS just run a plan called Open Source Promotion Plan. So same. Uh, same goes. Uh, so luckily, the program is approved uh, smoothly. So uh, uh, from that, every year we will sponsor uh, students to do contribution for uh, open source project. I'm proud. Uh, I'm very proud about this one. Uh, from the first year, we set the, this program global because we shouldn't uh, uh, close the door of communication. Otherwise, we. Uh, Instead, uh, we should uh, encourage our students and engineers to talk with international friends. And here, I will give my thanks to uh, some open source community, Kai Yuan She, Sagaman Fort, and ALS Beijing. And I'm happy to see uh, the founder of Kai Yuan She, Ted, also is here. And uh, th th thanks, organizer. Actually, this is my first time. Uh, meet uh, meeting face to time, uh, face to face with with Tide and uh, also other founders of the community. Thanks. And uh, last year, 2020, 2022, with about 124 community and 100 students uh, from 19 uh, countries, uh, including the two students from Singapore. And last week, we just announced. This year, we will support 133 uh, community. And uh, also, we see some familiar logs in this summit. Yeah. So welcome more uh, students and uh, projects to join some OSPP. OK, let's talk about the last uh, one, the last story. Yeah. It's about uh, my research institute. So why did the ISAS join, uh, join open source community? Because we believe open source have become the cornerstone of software development. 
We also believe when we participated closely in open source community, contribute to open source and promote open source, we will have more uh, good uh, research achievement around open source. Recently, we, uh, we focused on open source software supply chain and the risk of file related uh, research. Hope if you are interested in about it, let's, let's talk about it. And uh, so after three years, uh, this slide is my favorite because there are so many numbers. Yeah, and uh, after three years, uh, Open Euler, we have uh, 800 organization members in this community. And we also have 106 uh, special interest group in this community. And uh, this number represents the powers of uh, Open Euler. So, and uh, we also pleased to know that the, uh, in the past three years, uh, there are many company, they got um, uh, rapid visiting growth based on Open Eula, uh distribution. And uh, I hope and I believe that uh, the uh, further commercial uh, achievements will promote uh, the development of Open Eula and open source. Yeah, so, we got the answer how to build an operating system community for all scenario solution. Uh, communication, uh, we talk with upstream to help us create innovative project. And uh, luckily, thanks organized, thanks for Asia. Uh, in these three days, we have many opportunity to uh, talk with you about Open Eula. This afternoon, Dr. Xing Wei, uh, he is one of the technical leaders in our uh, Open Eula community. She will talk more about uh, diversified computing. And we also have uh, three uh, senior engineers from Open Euler uh, to share with you about uh, innov innovative projects in Open Euler. So uh, this is our contact information. And uh, as a TC member, luckily uh, this year, I will spend the most of the time in Singapore. We hope we can establish local group and organize some uh, more techni technology events. Singapore is a great, uh, ha has a great diverse culture. And uh, I think, I believe Open Euler also can do a great job on diversi diversifying computer computing. So uh, this is my LinkedIn, welcome to connect. Uh, so that's all and uh, may the force of open source be with us. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yes, uh, so thank you very much. Uh, um, and uh, yeah, we can now talk a bit with you directly here. Uh, we have a small break uh, downstairs. Um, and you also have a, a booth where we can sit down right next to the um, uh, catering area, okay, right? Okay, okay, so, okay. short break, 15 minutes, please.
Share about your um, uh, yeah about yourself and about um, your activities with Code Without Barriers. Thank, thank you. you very much for joining. Thank you for the opportunity. Good morning. Uh, I think you had a wonderful morning half session. Uh, I caught some parts of it, um, and here I am uh, to talk to you about Code Without Barriers. Code Without Barriers was born during the pandemic. We saw two trends collide. Uh, I'm talking about 2020, early 2020, mid 2020s. One was that technology was overtaking the world. Every organization, every person had to be tech enabled. My mother suddenly learned WhatsApp and Zoom and everything and figured out how to talk to me and her grandchildren and things like that. Every business, whether it was large enterprise where developers suddenly were remote and had to connect, all the small mom and pop shops, which had some legacy systems, which couldn't take the load of so many online uh, purchases, or even the vendor on the street who suddenly had to have a QR code and start doing business through that. So technology just overtook everything. And in the midst of that, there was some technology that was actually changing the way we live and work. AI at that time, in the early 20s, and now it's generative AI. It's going to completely change how we live, work, build products, so on and so forth. So when we looked at it, we saw that um, a few problems arising out of these AI systems. So in 2020, uh, 22 actually, um, or rather 2020, I think, the Dutch court uh, forbid a particular AI-led software which was looking for uh, social security fraud. And the reason it became a big issue, came to court, and the algorithm failed. 
failed in the court, I mean, because they found that what the algorithm was picking up as potential fraud cases were migrant workers, single women, and things like that. And that was one case. Another one was in, the, in, in many cities in the US, facial recognition has been now been banned from being used in police enforcement and criminal law and order. One of the reasons was one big case which called out that um, most of the, they were using a predictive model behind to see who is a potential uh, risk. And they were using a model in such a case that they were looking at who's a second order of a circle, third order of circle, and pulling up people who had some offenders already in that circle and pulling them. And in that, more, who do you guess, were showing up? In the US, who are showing up? The black male, <laughs> first of all. And so, uh, and then a lot of these models were not explainable. It was like black boxes. So obviously that was banned. Another tech giant was using uh, AI in recruitment. They used 10 years of data to load uh, their models and then found that women were just being uh, removed from the potential list right off the bat. Anytime there was, because they were looking at who were hired, basis what was on the resume, and so anything related to women, female, diversity, all of that right off the bat was getting cut off. So they actually pulled it back uh, and stopped using that algorithm. So what's fundamental among all of the, and there are so many more cases, right? As simple as um, if you type CEO on the search engine, you will find a truckload of white and now a little brown is added because a lot of Indian male CEOs are coming in. But in any case, it's all male CEOs. Here and there, you will see a few women. So when you talk about uh, potential role models to young girls and women who are trying to get into the field, they go look at, I remember particularly an eight-year-old girl who looked up, asked her to do software coding, she looked up and said, oh, it's a boy's game because all she's seeing is boys playing on that. So all of this combined with the second trend, which was 1.8x job losses for women in Asia as against men. And this is higher in the West during the pandemic. And interestingly, uh, worldwide, there's 1.1 million gap in women coming back after the pandemic into the job workforce. And what does that mean for the GDP? That's an entire different uh, conversation altogether. But so we saw these two trends collide and we went to the communities, the open source communities out there, spoke to them about how can we make them. We first went to women in tech communities, of course, that is the first stop. And they said, hey, we're trying to do a lot, but we're not able to make the needle move. And so we went and spoke to the general open source communities. One example is data and engineering in Indonesia. There's 7,000 developers in there, They're very active, uh, regular meetups. Spoke to the community leader. It's how many women are there in your community? And he's like, what? Nobody asked me that question ever, so I don't know. But I never see a woman in the meetups. And then the next question is, but why are they not there? He's asking back because it's an open community. Why are they not joining? And so we go back to the women in tech individuals and have a conversation, and they talk about male dominated words that are used a speaker uh, a woman speaker treats questions back differently than a male sometimes the men don't understand why and sometimes the women also don't understand why which is why we thought that there needed to be an intervention and an intervention at a scale that would make the needle move and and so we created code without barriers we went back to the drawing table and said, so Microsoft's mission is to empower every developer, every person, every organization on the planet to achieve more. How can you do that if you're excluding 50% of the women out there already? So we went back to the drawing board and saw that in our ecosystem, we had a powerful ecosystem and there are a bunch of customers and partners who are looking for talent and we're looking for all kinds of talent and female talent as well. And then there were communities that we work with. So we brought the two together, created this platform called Code Without Barriers. And what it does is it's open to 
all communities that joined. So we have 31 open source communities today, including FOSS Asia. Uh, Women Who Code is right here, Girls in Tech. Uh, so a lot of those communities, plus the general open source communities, those are the data engineering, AI, DevOps, all of those communities. And we provide programs to skill and certify the women. That's fundamental. That's a given, right? But more importantly, we went to the customers and partners and said, hey, you need to do something to actually help the women find the opportunities and create diversity in an organization. A typical conversation starts with a data science head and you ask them, so uh, you're doing AI, so what about responsible AI? Yes, fairness, inclusion, diversity, all part of fair, responsible AI. So how many women do you have on the team or how many uh, diverse thought uh, leaders do you have on the team? And that would stall them. So obviously they wanted to, so what they did was um, about today we have about 52 industry subject matter experts on data, AI, DevOps, you name it, all technology areas. They are ready to mentor the women who have been skilled and certified. So we have a running mentoring circle in the afternoon. There's a skilling panel and Sindhu, Sindhu Chingad, uh, my peer, will talk about the mentoring circles a little bit more. But these mentoring circles are crucial because women are sometimes held back by women themselves. <laughs> and it sometimes starts from home where the mother treats the daughter and the, and the son differently. So we have to get over a lot of that, which we do. The second thing is allyship. So this is not going to happen without all the men in this room participating alongside us, right? Women are only half the equation in diversity and inclusion. The other half is men because men are already there being decision makers, have a voice. Women sometimes don't have the voice and your support is actually going to make that uh, difference if you stand up and voice uh, for inclusion. So mentoring is a big one and our customers and partners are providing the mentors. The second one is hackathon. So you can skill as much as you want, but unless you are doing, uh, you're not building the confidence to go and sit at the table and say why you have a thought that's more different and what value you bring to the table. So hackathons have been brilliant because one example in Singapore itself is there was a student from finance and marketing who came into the hackathon, uh, AI hackathon. She skilled AI fundamentals and today she's a Python developer. <laughs> and that was the first interview she went to. Uh, because post the hackathon, she had the confidence to build five, six other projects in her portfolio. And then she applied. She got the courage to apply for a Python developer post, and she got it. And she was like, wow, I'm surprised myself because I'm the first one to get placed from my batch, and I got into a tech job. So imagine the potential lying there. So hackathons just build confidence and bring them out. The problem statements come from the customers and partners. So they are real industry use cases. Like Carsum is talking about uh, ranking of cars and things like that. So they bring real industry use cases, support the women to hack on it, and then get them ready for the jobs and internships. So the customers and partners bring jobs, internships, we have about 200 data apprenticeships from Petronas, which is one of the oil and gas major in Malaysia, to Prudential, Barclays, uh, Johnson & Johnson. So it's across industries. Every industry is looking to build the talent. And today, these industry, these customers are getting more aware of responsibly building solutions, open source, AI, all of that, and hence requiring diversity in it. So my call to you is to come be allies and to the women uh, to come be part of it. You are here, so you're already ahead of the game, but bring more of the women around you, participate in all of this, and uh, build your story and let there be more speakers and more, uh, uh, in AI especially, we want everybody, like in design, development, testing, user, policy making. So that's the vision, and hopefully we will get there. So, thank you. Well, uh, Annie, thank you very much. And uh, I think we'll have to get a short. Yes.
let me cover my face up. We have to get there. We So Sandeep, you are senior director in um, MySQL, MySQL here in Singapore. Yes, that's right. I'm based out of Singapore. That's uh, that that picture was probably taken ten years ago. So, as you can see, uh, the the product in front of you is far different from the picture up on the screen. My apologies for that. No, no, no. I, I wouldn't say that. You look like uh, very very young, right? We all stayed at home in Corona sports and everything. So. Yeah. Look very uh, well in shape, and uh, um, so how long have you been with uh, Oracle? I have only been with Oracle a uh, little more than five years, so mm -hmm. not too long, and all of those five years have been with MySQL. Okay, very nice, good. So um, finally, we have the chance to meet. I make it on presentation. Yes, some folk, you have a... this is the um, older version. Ah, this is you no, just no, sent this, this, this is the, this the okay. newer version. Uh, this is the new latest version. My friend there uh, helped me put it up, so ah, okay. it's all good. Excellent. Good. Then, yeah, good to have you here. And uh, also, like you will share at the end about the MySQL track um, dat and database track that we have here at the event. Absolutely. So, thank you very much for joining us and big round of applause for Sandeep. Thank you, Mario. You're too okay. kind. Thank you. So, I have a ton of, uh, I have a quite a few slides and I'm going to try and run through these as quickly as I can. Starting first with reintroducing all of you to MySQL, you know, the product has been around for some time. It's been there for about 25 years. And for those of you that are not really familiar, there's this company called DatabaseEngines.com, which monitors uh, about 350 databases across the world, ranks them in order of their popularity. They use different uh, parameters. They look at uh, job boards. They look at uh, technical discussions. And they create a list of pe people's uh, database popularity. Now, MySQL has been uh, the most popular open source database on that list, at least for the last five years that I've been here. Uh, in fact, uh, and a couple of years ago, it was also awarded the database uh, of the year, which was an extremely proud moment for us. The reason we are able to kind of maintain this lead is because it's also popular with developers. Uh, if you look at uh, surveys done to uh, measure engagement with the developer community, whether they are from Stack Overflow or JetBrains, MySQL remains, to, uh, remains a very popular uh, database uh, amongst the entire open source uh, you know, uh, crop of databases out there. And uh, all the work that these developers do, it finally results in the fact that there are a lot of innovative organizations out there that are running across, uh, running on MySQL. Uh, MySQL is the database behind Facebook. Facebook, uh, as we know, has three billion users, uh, lots, of, uh, lots of queries, uh, lots of interactions with the database. Uh, it's used in uh, social applications like Twitter, it's used in Pinterest. And then on an e-commerce side, it's the main transactional database for booking.com which is booking almost uh, one and a half million room nights a day. So uh, massive, massive, uh, uh, massive scalability, massive use case. Uh, MySQL is also the uh, database behind the uh, e-commerce applications of Netflix and Uber. Uh, so I guess what I'm trying to say is that, you know, uh, ev uh, it's even though very light and very uh, easy to use database, it has been used at scale in uh, applications, in industries across different, uh, uh, different uh, countries. 
Uh, we, we see a lot of uh, use cases in finance recently because, you know, uh, with the pandemic, one of the things that happened was everything went digital, including currency. A lot of countries are launching digital currency now. A lot of payment processing applications are coming up. Super apps are coming up. And uh, we see old traditional banks pivoting to these new use cases. And we have a bunch of customers in that area that use MySQL. Old school manufacturing companies are also using MySQL to run their IoT applications. And especially in this part of the world, we've seen a lot of use cases deployed by government. We've got a lot of support from government, uh, government to use open source in uh, providing citizen services, uh, you know, uh, uh, to their uh, to their population. So, a bunch of different my, uh, uh, open source applications are running on uh, running on MySQL, uh, and the common uh, common uh, use cases that we've seen uh, are uh, you know content management, digital payments, authentication systems, and this list has continued to grow. MySQL is one of the fastest growing uh, businesses inside Oracle globally. And uh, we're really overwhelmed by uh, the number of users that use our product. We see almost about 100,000 downloads of MySQL on a daily basis from, my, uh, from mysql.com. Uh, and what this has really done is it has prompted us to kind of like look back and see how do we provide highly available and secure uh, infrastructure how, uh, and uh, database architecture to our users because they're building mission critical applications, right? So in the past, uh, database HA from MySQL was a very manual process. We didn't really offer a lot of tools and uh, you know uh, for the database uh, engineer to build high available solutions, and there was a lot of customization that the DB had to do. The DB had to think about, uh, you know, user management, configuration, replication, etc., and everything was unique to that particular installation, which also makes it very hard to support because then, you know, there are just a small handful number of people who know what's going on inside. Now, what we've done is we've come up with something called InnoDB cluster, and InnoDB cluster typically has uh, uh, three, uh, at least three nodes: one primary and two secondaries. And when uh, one, one of the nodes fails, the other one automatically takes over. And HA is natively built into the InnoDB cluster, so all tasks about uh, for high availability are done automatically. You can also have one cluster in one region and then connect it with a, to a second cluster through, uh, in, a, in a different region through asynchronous replication. And that basically allows you to provide a disaster recovery scenario so that if an entire region goes down, you can do a manual failover and uh, move to the uh, move to the other region. Uh, there are going to be sorry, suddenly I become very loud. There are going to be a lot of uh, there are five more sessions around MySQL uh, uh, aspects such as InnoDB cluster later on uh, uh, during these three days, and I would encourage you to attend those uh, sessions by my more technical colleagues who can you know dive deeper into uh, into these different technologies. The other thing that the whole world is focused around is on security. Uh, cost of data breaches is very high. Data in front of you is from uh, a study done in the US where every data breach is costing a company somewhere around $10 million. And a high number of companies have experienced a data breach. So it's almost like you start to wonder, is it a question of if, or is it a question of when I will have a data breach? Right, so we have to be prepared around that, and then uh, this is a minor plug, uh, 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 you know, into linking back with open source software as well. Uh, Red Hat does an annual survey around uh, the state of open source in the enterprise, and when they first started doing this survey about four years ago, the number one reason why companies uh, CIOs were looking at open source was total cost of ownership. It's going to help me lower my bill. So today that situation has changed where the top two reasons are better security and higher quality software as the two main reasons for that. In fact, 89% of enterprise CIOs surveyed by Red Hat actually believe that open source software 
is of better quality than proprietary software because people are able to look at the code, the code is auditable. Open source companies have also done a tremendous job of providing uh, bug fixes and patches in a timely manner. And in the last four or five years, the uh, acceptability of open source in the enterprise has, uh, has really increased. Uh, on the same lines, you know, MySQL has uh, another version that we call as the enterprise version. That's, uh, that's our uh, paid version. So we love all MySQL users, whether you're using our free version or our paid version. But uh, the paid version does come with a lot of additional features and functionality, especially around security that is built into the product. And you kind of like don't have to look at other tools to try and make a really secure solution. I've listed down a few of the features. And then there are, I have some, uh, you know, you can find out more about this on the web, but basically all the uh, key things like transparent data encryption, MySQL audit, firewall, enterprise masking, uh, a single pane of glass to monitor your entire MySQL estate, all that stuff is available through the MySQL Enterprise Edition at a very small nominal cost compared to, uh, compared to uh, commercial editions of uh, other database software. Uh, one other area that we have been focused around is to, you know, maintain our popularity with developers and focused on uh, how to make developers, uh, make, make it easy for, my, uh, for developers to work with MySQL. And, and we've, we've been consistently receiving feedback that, you know, MySQL, you're doing too many, uh, too many updates. You have a lot of new versions coming up, whereas I've got uh, production environments running on MySQL and I can't keep doing updates and patches on a regular basis. So uh, right now our current version is 8.0.31. The next MySQL release that we have will be what we are going to call as a long-term support release. And that product uh, will have, uh, you know, regular bug fixes and patches but it will be supported for a minimum number of eight years, three years uh, uh, on extended support and five years on premier support. So uh, if you're running uh, an environment where, you know, you want, uh, you want complete control, you want complete visibility on and not have to do regular changes and, uh, uh, you know, don't have to uh, cope with the update and patch, patch update madness on a regular basis, you can pick the long-term support release as your product. And if you're the kind of customer who wants to look at, you know, the latest and the greatest update and be able to, uh, you know, have the latest innovation, we're also going to have innovation releases. We're going to make it easy to migrate between the LTS release and the innovation release. But you can pick and choose what you want, which world do you want to live in. That, I think, will hopefully give developers the confidence uh, to, you know, continue building uh, their applications on MySQL. Um, and then finally, uh, we also created this marriage between uh, the most popular open source database, which is MySQL, and the most popular development uh, environment, which is Visual Studio. And uh, we put all features of My MySQL shell in Visual Studio code, so you can get everything that MySQL shell does to manage and uh, you know configure your database, but with a uh, but with GUI now. Uh, now that we have uh, MySQL shell for uh, VS Code. Uh, and then finally, we also added a REST service uh, uh, architecture. So uh, you can talk to your MySQL database through the MySQL router. Uh, it's supported on OpenAuth2, uh, Open uh, provides low-level security, great way to serve up JSON documents. A lot of innovation. Actually, there was, uh, you know, there was a MySQL summit back in Redwood Shores just uh, two weeks ago. So we have had so much of innovation. And I really encourage all of you to, you know, come to the different MySQL sessions uh, tomorrow. We also created a, you know, launch an open, uh, launch an operator for Kubernetes. This product is developed by uh, the same team that builds the InnoDB cluster, and it um, it's currently a level three operator, but it uh, it has it automates all the major tasks of deploying InnoDB cluster in a Kubernetes environment. Uh, our, our hope and our, uh, not our hope, our, our long-term goal is to continue to develop the operator and move it to a level four operator, which will have, you know, provide more insight around uh, uh, alerts, around uh, logs, etc. 
So uh, watch out for this space. And I think uh, one of our other sessions uh, tomorrow is all about uh, using uh, the operator in a Kubernetes environment as well. Uh, moving on, uh, all the stuff that I've spoken about is uh, so far is stuff that we have been doing on premise. And uh, if you're following cloud databases, we've, uh, MySQL has had some really great innovation with a product called uh, MySQL uh, Heatwave, which has uh, attracted a lot of press attention uh, over the last few, uh, you know, few quarters. So uh, MySQL Heatwave cloud service is a service that's available on Oracle cloud infrastructure. It's a 100% managed service. Uh, so whatever uh, typically a DBA does, we do it for you so that the DBA can you know, focus their attention on the, on the application side of the house and all regular OS patching, network management, uh, et cetera, is uh, done by the service uh, in an automated manner. The Heatwave Cloud, uh, MySQL Heatwave, is uh, what we are calling a single database for OLTP, OLAP, and ML. Uh, now, as, as we said earlier in this uh, earlier in this talk, right, uh, and we showed you that uh, MySQL is extremely popular with social applications, e-commerce applications. Now imagine you have an e-commerce application connected to MySQL Heatwave, uh, which is, uh, as I mentioned, a single database for OLTP and OLAP. Because of inbuilt machine learning, that the, your customer who's out uh, looking to buy something on your e-commerce application will get uh, recommend, real time recommendations on other ancil other products that they can buy uh, because again it's a single database you can run analytics without ever having to move data out of your uh, of your transactional environment putting into it uh, putting it into uh, you know a, a single purpose analytics database so there's no etl required at all uh, Heatwave works with the standard machine learning, uh, you know, tools that uh, 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 AI enthusiasts are familiar with. It also works with uh, uh, visualization tools like uh, Oracle Analytics Cloud, Tableau, etc. So one single place to do everything. Uh, if if you built your transactional workloads on MySQL, this is a really good uh, uh, good solution for you and you don't have to think about uh, you know any etl activity to uh, work on uh, uh, on on uh, my mysql transactional business anymore uh, on on a high availability standpoint uh, on the cloud deploying a ha cluster is very simple when you open the oci console and you're trying to provision you know creating your db systems you just choose the you know hey i want a, a ha cluster and the system will kind of create uh, those clusters for you. So it's as simple as that. And if you're wondering how does this product compare from a pricing standpoint with everything else that our competitors have, we ran some standard TPCH queries on a benchmark and found that it's way faster than uh, AWS Aurora. And because it's faster does the, and, and is already priced cheaper, uh, customers can uh, actually save, uh, save a bunch of money. So uh, that's with Aurora, and this is with Snowflake, which is you know a purpose-built uh, analytics database. Uh, we so show a lot of price leadership uh, there as well. Uh, and then uh, initially, when we launched with Heatwave, we just had uh, one one particular uh, uh, you know uh, shape available. And now we are announcing more shapes available on the basis of customer demand, adding more. Uh, adding more capability to improve price performance, adding more data handled per node as well, while, all the while while uh, you know continuing to uh, demonstrate price leadership. Um, now switching gears and talking a little bit about automation that you know uh, and uh, what what are we doing on that front? So MySQL Heatwave has something called MySQL uh, Autopilot, which is uh, machine learning powered automation. So when you're starting to you know, use MySQL Heatwave. It looks at your, uh, it looks at the information that you provided while creating the database system, and gives you a recommendation: how many nodes you should have, what should be the shape of the node. It looks at your data and figures out how can it load this data quickly in a parallel way in the memory of uh, of the Heatwave nodes. And once uh, the advisor has finished creating this uh, system for you, it continues to kind of like monitor uh, in, a, in an automated fashion that entire system. If a node fails, it detects that a node has failed. It will automatically provision another node. It will automatically load data onto that other node. 
and um, uh, you know uh, basically automates most of the regular tasks that you would have to do. Um, and after, after the system is up and running, it continues to monitor it. Uh, it continues to check what have you, uh, you know, provisioned for, what is your actual usage looking like, should you be scaling your system up, should, be, uh, should you be scaling your system down. So all these facilities are already integrated uh, in, uh, in the autopilot. So analysts have been extremely, uh, you know, positive with their praise, uh, praise around MySQL uh, heatwave. Uh, you know, I have some uh, quotes here that uh, from IDC may very well be the single greatest innovation in open source cloud databases in the past 20 years. And I would encourage you folks to go to oracle.com slash MySQL and read some of these, uh, uh, you know, analyst uh, uh, white paper, so to speak, for yourself. We have a lot of customer testimonials there as well. We have a lot of early adopters for Heatwave. And actually, not just early adopters, now people are putting production workloads on, on Heatwave. And we have quite a few case studies out there, and I would really encourage you guys to go look at those. At FOSS Asia, we have these five sessions where all the things that I spoke about just in one slide, people are going to spend 50 minutes going deep into them and, and, you know, kind of like having a deeper discussion with you uh, on that. So uh, I'm, I'm really hopeful that, uh, you know, uh, you guys show up tomorrow in large numbers to all these different five sessions and talk to more knowledgeable people than me as to what really makes uh, all these technologies work. And then finally, uh, if you haven't done already, go create a trial account for MySQL Heatwave. There's $300 of free credits. Look at it, play around with it ask questions uh, on, uh, on, uh, on community forums, and get started. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sandeep. Yeah, I'm also very impressed by Heatwave. I read like uh, uh, people are sending a lot of money. They speak it different in English, different in German, and I, I never know which way you use to transcribe transcribe your name from um, uh, uh, Cyrillic to uh, you know Latin characters. It should be written with K H, so Michev. Ah, Michev. Yeah. Okay. Not in yeah. German, Michev. Yeah. No. Yeah. Okay, I see. Yeah, so great to have you both. You are based in Latvia, uh, or where are you based? Me because personally in Uzbekistan. So, in Uzbekistan. But I will talk about that later ah. a little bit. We have lots offices now okay. and as well as here in Singapore yes yeah. okay so I leave it to you everything is in your presentation let me like take um, off this um, thing and then thanks yeah thank you very much only office I think like many years you're already on board and supporting many, many. Yeah. First Asia and uh, you're connected also to um, many other people here at the event very glad to have you here welcome Alex hello good afternoon good afternoon ladies and gentlemen yeah, it's a pleasure to be here with you personally, first time personally, yeah. Uh, and to talk about one of the most important issues facing the businesses in 2020s. I mean, document collaboration. 
So my name is Alex. I'm with Only Office, and I'm responsible for their professional services. For the next few minutes, I will I will try to take you through challenges of the document editing and uh, how Only Office can help your team to overcome them. So let's get started. Uh, the pandemic has had a significant uh, impact on the way we work. So now the employees prefer to work from home and remote work is now more relevant. So uh, now all remote workers need to be able to work on their documents from anywhere, to collaborate on their documents and to ensure the security of their documents. But all these challenges can be difficult to overcome without using right software. So, but with only office, you can ensure effective teamwork regardless of where your team is located. Uh, we have identified four main tasks for us in 2023. So first one is security. It is very important. So with this growing number of the security threats, it is important to make the document collaboration as secure as possible. The second one is the document collaboration itself. So we would like to make the software that help you to organize collaboration. So everyone should be able to work with their teammates on the documents. Thirdly, usability. We would like to provide an excellent, I'd like to say, uh, brilliant user experience. And finally, finally, flexibility and integrations. And this is, I think, the key point. We would like to make our software accessible for everyone, regardless of their platform or their device. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about OnlyOffice. What is OnlyOffice? It is an open source project focused on secured and advanced document editing. So uh, it comprises the editors for text documents, slides, sheets, PDF files, and of course, digital forms. So uh, OnlyOffice has Office Open XML as a core file format. And it also has a single engine for desktop, mobile, and web versions. And you can switch from offline to online and vice versa. That's very important. Uh, in 2022, we had, uh, I guess, three major releases and more than five uh, intermediate hotfixes. So we do like, we do love making releases. We do love fixing bugs and adding new features. That's true. Uh, now let's have a deeper look at the first point we have identified. So the security. Are you worried about unauthorized access to your important documents? Worry no more. Since version 7.2, only Office has JSON Web Token enabled by default. What, what does it mean? It means that everything you need to do is just adding secret part to your host application, to your CMS, to your DMS, or anything else. And that's all. Uh, when I take a security step further, just replace the default key with your own value again. It has never been easier to protect your spreadsheets with only Office. Now you are able to protect your sheets and workbooks. But not only that, you are also able to allow editing only for specific ranges, hide formulas, log cells, or I don't know, there are many options. Uh, version 7.3 takes document editing to another security level. Now you can protect your text document, allowing editing only certain actions. So uh, reading, for example, filling forms, there are many, many user rights available here. And this sophisticated feature uh, gives you complete control over who can edit or access your document. And now a little bit about the collaboration. Introducing only Office forms. 
what is on your office forms. Say goodbye to tedious paperwork routine. Just create model document that contains a lot of different fields like text areas, combo boxes, drop down lists, and many, many others. You are able to communicate on your forms with your teammates. Then you can save them if it's necessary. If you need a hard copy, just export it to PDF. That's all. And we, in version 7.3, we have added a new functionality. Now you are able to create and assign recipient roles for form fillet. What does it mean? It means that it is more comfortable to end user to identify which fields to fill out. Uh, we also have added some uh, new fields like date and time with various display options, zip code and credit cards. I'm looking for free and easy to use templates, form templates. We have good news. Uh, it is only Office free forms library. It has lots of different forms in different languages. And almost everything that you need to automate your paperwork process. If you cannot find the right form, just let us know. We will create it for you. Or if you are interested in placing your form into the library, again, let us know. We will add the information that you are the author of that form. We will place the link to your, I don't know, to your website, to your WeChat or anything else. We have lots of partners who already have their forms in our library. Uh, the next very important news, uh, I think it's a new um, live view mode. Now you are able to open documents, spreadsheets or presentations in view only mode, but you are able to see what's happening in real time. So all changes are visible. There is no need to wait to click on save on refresh button or anything else. Uh, almost the same for on the office spreadsheet, here, course of display, a new option that allows you to see the selections of your teammates marked with different colors. Again, everything for co-editing. We know that version history is very important when you edit your documents. And this is why on the office document uh, spreadsheet editors now have that option. So you are able to uh, dig into your drafts to look for an old version and restore it if it's necessary. A little bit about commands. Now you're able to sort all commands in the document to sort by date, by time, by author or alphabetically. We do have two new modes for displaying uh, changes in the review mode. So the first one is when you click and all changes are displayed in balloons. And the second one is when you hover your mouse over the changes, it's displayed in tooltips. Uh, what about usability enhancement? So we have updated our fonts engine. That's very important right here. Say hello to uh, half bus uh, texts fonts library. So it allows us to use new scripts. Now we do support ligatures. Now we are able to combine few symbols into a single one. You know what is it? And now we, we do support many new languages. Uh, Bengali or Sinhala uh, are supported now and we are continuously working on that. On Office is all about customization, all about usability. And this is why we do support dark themes, but not only that, we do support uh, dark contrast customizations and we can enable dark mode or light mode depending on your operating system changes. There are lots of changes in the only office docs. So, uh, for example, you can use local files 
and URLs when working on mail merge. Uh, the hyperlinks can be corrected automatically, and uh, the work with shapes is being more convenient. We do support all the spreadsheets, and what's very important, uh, search and replace engine has been updated. It is now more powerful and more comfortable to use. New features in spreadsheets, just few. Query tables, print preview, or hotkeys for paste specials. Just few of them. And of course, editors haven't left behind. So we do support now full animations. We do have new tabs for working with transitions. Again, hyperlinks can be auto-corrected and all the spreadsheets can be inserted. And the last version, 7.3, allows you to insert smart art objects to use Unicode and LaTeX equations and what's very important to use watch window. Uh, that's an option that allows to um, to work on your um, formulas with uh, with corrections, with checking the formulas before applying them in spreadsheets. Only Office is designed to work on all file types, on all formats. We do have Office Open XML as core file format, and we do our best to support all objects and all attributes of that format, of the standard. We have created two new formats. The first one is docxf, where f stands for form. That is a template of the file, template of the form. You are able now to work on the form, to share it, and then, if it is ready, you can share it with anyone, saving it to ready to fill out uh, all form format. We do also have uh, new viewers for PDF, XPS, and Deja Vu files. Here you can use new page thumbnail panel and new navigation bar. And all PDF files can be converted to docx and all other file types except for PDFA. I don't know who does use PDFA, but anyway. Uh, so all slides can be exported to PNG or JPG images. PPSX files are also supported for viewing. And now uh, my favorite part, integrations. As I said already, we want to make our software accessible for everyone, regardless of their platform or device. And this is, we do have more than 30 integrations, integrations external with uh, different <clears throat> DMS or CMS platforms, electronic learning platforms, and many, many others. But the first integration is the integration with our own solution, only Office Workspace. What is only Office Workspace is uh, a collaboration platform that allows you to use different productivity applications with CRM, project management, calendar, mail, and many, many other modules. And here we use our docs editors as default document editing engine. It has been updated when talking about that integration. And now new integrations. The first one is Moodle. It is very important. I know that lots of universities around the world are using that platform. Uh, we do already have it. And three integrations with frameworks like Strapi, WordPress, and Drupal. So if you are using one of these frameworks for your website, you are welcome to give a try to on the office. What about Moodle? Uh, it is available in the official Moodle plugin store. So all documents attached to Moodle courses can be edited with on the office now. And you are also able to collaborate on them if that's necessary. Uh, of course, we do not forget to update our existing connectors. Here you can see, uh, I think 
twice, maybe three times per year, we release new versions of every connector. So C file, Life Ray, Alfresco, there are lots of them. And uh, we have welcomed new platforms. For example, Tulip for open source agile management, Lenoir Francais for organizing French speaking community, and uh, Flink ISO for uh, quality management software. Now, a little bit about plugins. Who doesn't love a good plugin that can enhance your, for example, work on the documents? I'm sure that uh, there is no need to explain what is Jitsi, but now we do have integrations with these three handy platforms. Now you are able to organize voice call or video call right within the document editing software. The next plugin is Draw.io. Uh, unleash your inner artist using that plugin, so uh, Draw diagrams, mind maps, or charts. Uh, good news for Markdown fans, we have Doc2MD plugin. Now, your text can be saved, can be exported as Markdown. And, of course, last but not least, ChatGPT. So, uh, here, there is not about the hype around the ChatGPT. That's just a small plugin for using text generated with ChatGPT in your documents. If that's necessary, you're welcome to use it absolutely for free. And all these plugins can be installed from our official marketplace. What is marketplace? Uh, you can look for plugins, you can install them, you can remove them directly from the editors without closing them. A little bit about new macros. We have Examples for working with Google search for importing CSV and TXT data and again, for example, for using ChatGPT. As I said already twice, we want to make our software accessible for everyone regardless of their platform. And this is why we do have lots of distribution forms and packages. And good news. Only Office Docs is now available as a service, as a cloud service. There is no need to host, to customize, to install anything. Just go to on the Office web page and register on the Office Docs. Good news for ARM fans. On the Office Docs and Document Builder are available when using devices on ARM architecture. And we are proud that our desktop editors are included into many operating systems. Many operating systems. Here are just a few of them. And uh, I'd like to pay your attention to the fact that uh, we have compatibility certificate with China's operating system, Kylin OS. Our software can be provided as a service by different service providers like Alibaba, OVH Cloud, or AWS Marketplace. We, we are glad to be involved in some technological launches. For example, Minis Forum and Manjaro Linux have created their own mini PC, UM350, with only Office desktop pre-installed. And the same for Morena cell phones. They do provide our software in their ecosystem for editing their documents. If you are using Angular or React or Vue, you are welcome to use one of our examples. There are few available on our web page. And one very good news for developers. We have created a new API class to access documents from outside, from external interfaces. Now you are able to communicate with the content of your document without relying on document editor buttons, just using API methods. A little bit about Document Builder. We have updated .NET Doctor Render Library to make more comfortable, uh, I mean, working with uh, Document Builder if you have 
application written in .NET. And a little bit about our team and our locations. We now have new offices here in Singapore, in Armenia, in Uzbekistan, and in Serbia. Our team is growing, and that helps us to provide high-quality technical support, high-quality professional services. That is very important for us. Again, we are here in Singapore. We are glad that we have won uh, cloud computer, uh, cloud content management award in cloud computing insider awards, and it is an honor to be recognized as one of the most important cloud content management platforms. And <laughs> thanks. And a little bit about our future plans. Uh, we we do have lots of plans. We do have plans to add new features. We do have plans to add new options. But we also do have plans to make new products. And this is why we are working now on a new product called OnlyOffice DocSpace. What is it? We know almost everything about editing documents, about co-editing documents. And this is why we have created a new product. It is a new way to collaborate on your documents in the rooms called uh, in the spaces called rooms so you can collaborate with your teammates you can share your documents you can you can invite new users you can customize the rooms and what is very important this product can be integrated into your solution we do have plans to include end-to-end -end encryption and our forms are also can be integrated into that product. That is absolutely new way how to co-author your documents, how to work with your teammates. We do have lots of plans. We do have plans to add right to left support. We do have plans to add new languages in the interfaces, to edit documents on mobile devices in a new way, in a brand new way and to add digital signatures. Again, talking about the previous product on the office doc space, digital signatures are also supported. Thank you a lot for your time. So we have a booth downstairs. If you are interested, just come. We can show you everything you need or you are interested in. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. And uh, how long will you stay in Singapore? Uh, three. three more days. Three days, yeah. Okay, great. So, yeah, time to catch up and learn more uh, about this, about only Office. Been using it for years. Thank you very much. Cool. And uh, yeah, before the lunch break, we have the last uh, session. Okay, cool. So, and uh, um, yeah, how, how long will you stay? Like, just Alex, uh, how, how much time do you have in Singapore? I'll speak the end of it. Uh, I'm sorry. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. We have uh, until time. Sunday? Yeah, until Saturday. Okay, that's great. And uh, um, uh, I heard that you are working like uh, with quite a few people in Singapore together. So, there will be a yeah. hardware track. We had a lot of interest, a lot of yeah. uh, people wanted to join that hardware track that will be on Friday and uh, also a few more sessions on, on Saturday. You will have a longer session there. But we have a short peak in your work right now. Thank so thank you very much for sharing about this. Johan, thank you.
So yeah, thank you for having me, and uh, I'm happy to be here to give a short intro about like open source silicon ecosystem. And so my name is Joanne Frozin. Uh, online, I go by Propi. I joined uh, Google like in 2011, so a little bit more uh, 12 years ago. Uh, I've been doing a developer relations there. So I'm a developer relations engineer, meaning that I'm focusing on uh, improving the developer experience for a variety of uh, Google developer products. I started working on uh, some of the cloud developer products of Google first. Uh, then I worked a little bit on Android too, and more recently uh, I've worked on IoT and hardware things. Uh, this year, or last year, I joined a new team uh, at Google called the hardware uh, toolchain team. And uh, my presentation is about like uh, what this team is doing and how we are trying to build an open source silicon ecosystem. So the core team mission is that it's to make custom silicon easier to build for everyone at scale, just like software. Like, uh, if you can think of something like, uh, I know many of you are, are, are auto developer and you, you're familiar with like some optimization file that you can, uh, flag that you can pass to your compiler. And sometimes you go, uh, you max like those optimization possibility. And there is nothing that you can do in software to optimize further. So our vision is that we'd like you to help you to go to the next step, uh, to help you to optimize your stuff in hardware. And usually the gap between, uh, jumping from a software product to a pro uh, hardware product is pretty big. And we'd like to make it that as easy as just changing your compiler flag. So we're not there yet, but that's like the vision. So imagine that you have an optimization flag and you can like say that you want to optimize stuff in silicon and then give you the hardware design to optimize like that uh, translation unit. And in order to get there, we found out that there are like missing pieces. So in uh, ICAD in 2020, like uh, the team founder actually like uh, released a, pro, uh, a paper there called the missing pieces of open design enablement. Enable, he, he identified like four things that are missing for creating like a, an open ecosystem in hardware that could strive as much as a software one. So first like uh, open source PDK. So in software world, we take it for granted that uh, we have like some open source SDK and library that we can build or, or, or work on. And uh, often like uh, our work is consist on remixing like a few libraries that we want to produce something original. Like it doesn't really work like this in hardware. Like uh, the very uh, lower level of the stack, which is a PDK, you can think of it as an SDK for hardware. It's the thing that defines like the specification of uh, the foundry, uh, of the process of the foundry, the thing that will allow you to manufacture something uh, with that foundry. It's the interface of the foundry. And those things currently require, most of them require an NDA. And so like you can't even start uh, developing your hardware project until you sign a contract with the foundry. The other thing is like, uh, and so we realize that if we want to allow people to do custom hardware, we have to have open source PDK. The other thing is a silicon toolchain. So we take it for granted in, in software that most of the or compiler or debugger uh, optimization tool are uh, open source and you can run it on any computer and you can run it in the cloud like it doesn't really work like this you know uh, it wasn't really working like this in hardware like a few years ago like most of the tool were proprietary you had like proactive li license costs to get started and even more important you couldn't run like those tool really freely or on the cloud or on weird architecture um, the other thing is that like because there is this bottom of the stack with the tooling and the pdk uh, that were mostly proprietary. Um, it meant that basically all the building blocks that people were building on top of those two were also tied to proprietary solution. So there was like very little reuse of like other people and sharing between people design. And the last thing is like it's, it costs a lot to manufacture silicon. It can cost like uh, tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of dollars for to just do like a simple batch on a very, very old technology. It could cost like as millions of dollars to do something on a more modern process, meaning that the cost of error is huge. Like if you make a design mistake, like uh, it's gonna cost you like uh, thousands or millions of dollars. And so it's really prohibitive for people to um, get into that field because like uh, in order to learn something, you have to make errors. And if this error could you, cost you a huge amount of, uh, of money, you're not really incentivized to learn this. And so we identify that if we basically provide open source PDK, an open source silicon toolchain, if we provide an easy way for people to generate blocks that they can share and reuse, and if we provide them with cheaper and faster manufacturing option, 
we can create like uh, a bootstrap uh, an open source ecosystem that could be comparable comparable with uh, software. And so that's what we tried to do with that team. So um, we partner with uh, uh, a few foundry uh, across like uh, the world. Uh, so the first one is Skywater, and we manage like to convince them to open source uh, a PDK for one of their older 130 nanometer technology. So there is like two variants of the, uh, the PDK. So there is a Sky 130A, that's like a, a regular CMOS process. And there is the Sky 130B, which is as uh, the same process with a reram cell. Uh, so resistive RAM capability added. And that was like two years ago. Uh, last year, we managed to convince another foundry, Global Foundry, to open source um, uh, their uh, PDK for their 180 nanometer technology. So it was very important for the ecosystem because like we went from one to two. So the, the gap between zero to one was big, but, uh, and a lot of the tooling actually started like supporting like this Skywater PDK. And the gap between one to two was also very big because like all the tooling had to kind of remove the things that were specific to Skywater to start like supporting another PDK. And uh, like this year, there was also something that was very uh, good for the ecosystem that happened. So we had this foundry in Austria called IHP that uh, released their open source PDK, their PDK, an open source PDK for their 100 uh, nanometer technology without talking to Optima. So uh, before, like, uh, like Google kind of went to this foundry, tried to lobby them or convince them to open source their PDK. And we IHP was like a, the first example of an organic uh, release of uh, a foundry that didn't consult at all with us and that start releasing like their technology. And later this year, we hope that we'll be able to release like a 90 nanometer uh, PDK for the Sky 90 FD uh, um, uh, process. And uh, so once you have the PDK, uh, you can run like a, a toolchain on top of it. And so we support like uh, many of those uh, open source tools uh, from that ecosystem. There is tool that uh, we develop ourselves. So like for example, XCLS is an high level synthesis toolkit that Google develop uh, in house. And that we make sure that this tool like support like the various PDK uh, that we that got open sourced. Uh, we rely for synthesis on um, on a tool called Yosis that's very well known also inside the FPGA ecosystem. For place and route, we rely on Open Road and with a flow called Open Lane. And for um, the last step, which is producing a file that you send to the foundry for manufacturing, we rely on Magic and Kaliot. And so all these kind of toolchain give you an idea on how you can go to a high level description uh, that's really close to source code that describes the functionality that you want to accelerate. So in our case, like it's a X file. That, um, it's a syntax like close to Rust that allows you to describe like an algorithm that you want to create hardware for. And then you go to Verilog, which is like something that gets uh, really tied to, it's basically, an, it can get synthesized into an at least that match like uh, the process that you want to use. And then like this netlist get blasted uh, uh, with like the cell on natural silicon dye, and that's like what the left and the deaf are about. And then you stream that into a GDS format, which is describing the actual polygon that are being sent to the foundry for fabrication. And like all this toolchain can allow you to like produce this file like uh, using all the open source tool. And once you have the PDK and you have the tool, you still need a way to manufacture those chips. And like I mentioned before, like it could cost like uh, tens of thousands or maybe like hundreds of thousands of dollars to manufacture chip on those old, even on those older uh, technology. So we started um, for the two years, uh, uh, we've been running like uh, an open uh, MPW shutter program um, that basically come from no cost uh, to the community. Like the community uh, only need to produce like an open source design that's reproducible with the open source tool to enroll into that program. And uh, we've been selecting like 40 projects on each shuttle round uh, to get manufactured. And so like uh, at the end, like you get like a board like this with a little, little custom silicon chip on it. And you can like start um, like validating that the silicon result that you have actually match like uh, the, the intent of your design. Like every uh, single chip come with a user area that you see here where you can put your own logic and a little like resize chip on the bottom that can help you like troubleshoot your design. And that's like one of the picture of the wafer that got uh, manufactured on one of the first one. So we've seen an increasing engagement uh, from the community on the shuttle. So we run like nine shuttle on this program. 
and like uh, here you can see like uh, we started with only like 40 projects that then 55 and on the last shuttle we had as most as 150 projects that got submitted and so it means that we have accumulated like a pool of more than uh, 700 design uh, that are fully open source and reproducible with the open source tool so the tool have changed a lot so it could be challenging to reproduce like one of the earlier ones uh, with like the new version of the tool but still the source is available like uh, anybody could like look at the project and anybody could try to reuse like the bits that are there and we've seen engagement from all over the world on this program so that's like kind of a picture of like the the breakdown of project by country for one of the latest run that we run like gf mpw0 and so, so it's not only the United States, we've seen like, very good um, engagement from, uh, from country in APAC, uh, like Japan, India. Um, and currently we are uh, busy with the community trying to bring up like the silicon for the second shuttle, the MPW2 one. And here you can see various examples of people like playing with the ball, like validating um, like that silicon is actually working and like uh, kind of posting like the result online. I wanted to showcase like three projects that we've seen uh, on the this, uh, second shuttle where we've got like good results. So that one is like from uh, an actual professional, like a sub designer from Intel that has like 20 experience in hardware design. And so he did like this little RIS-5 um, microcontroller that's uh, compatible with Arduino. And like um, it has like a, a, an SDRAM memory controller on board. It also have a quite SPI like interface. And he was able like, to get like his chip booting and validate that the silicon was working. And when it, something that he said is that he like he has been in this industry for a long time. He, he wouldn't think that it will be possible for him to kind of build uh, like a custom silicon directly from his home, like from his home laptop, and being able to manufacture it for free. So someone else uh, that I thought was like uh, was bringing up uh, was like GetCat with like their, uh, the project that they did with uh, their university uh, from the Elder Berg University. So what they did is that they did a custom FPGA. So they implemented like an FPGA fabric uh, using the Skywater program. So you see the case of Skywater uh, process. So in the least, a, a tiny amount of loot there. It's only 100 loots, but um, the, the achievement is impressive because here they were able to run like uh, um, a custom uh, a custom FPGA logic using an open source FPGA toolchain targeting a chip that didn't exist before now uh, running on a FPGA uh, a custom FPGA fabric. So the the amount of things that could fail there uh, inside that stack is like impressive. Like uh, the toolchain couldn't could possibly not work. Like the design could be flawed. Like the silicon could also be. Uh, problematic and like they were able to validate that silicon and validate and here you see like in the middle they have a little FPGA demo that turned uh, that ran on their fabric and that show it working and so yeah that was like uh, impressive that they managed to get that uh, working on a on a brand new uh, open source PDK and the last one is like kind of dial uh, well into the narrative of democratizing uh, I see fabrication. So it comes from an online course called Zero to Asics, um, where they actually, instead of using like the, the whole um, chip area for just one design, what they did is that they run that course online uh, without really asking us for any permission. And they just entered, uh, entered like our shuttle and not submitted one design, but submitted 16 design from the school, uh, from the, this course uh, into one project slot. And like uh, most of the people on that, uh, I think like uh, 12 of the people of the 16 were actually first time designer. They, they never did an hardware design before. And they were going through that course curriculum and at the end like were able to submit their own design. And so it also show like how the, the, the community can, if you give like the community like constraint, like for example, you can fit like uh, uh, inside that amount of silicon area they will build like their own process and their own learning material and they will kind of adapt to this constraint and try to build something else. And I mean, I think it's very impressive what they managed to do here because they managed to get a lot more people uh, on top of this infrastructure that we set up uh, with um, better learning experience that we could have built. Okay, so the other thing I want to tell you is to uh, like, please, if you're interested in hardware, like feel free to join this community. We have a Slack channel with more than uh, 4,000 members in it, and we have like this uh, website called developer.google.com and this blog post that explains a little bit more. 
and I have a talk about that where I will actually go inside running those tools uh, with you uh, on Friday. So if you're interested, feel free to come there. Yeah, sorry, I went over. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, uh, more on Friday, definitely. I um, also know you work with... Uh, oh, they will all be there. Cool. Uh, we now have a lunch break. The lunch is sponsored by... Um, then we are back uh, here uh, in, uh, in the uh, 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 uh,
Uh, this is a uh, chart from the Chinese uh, venture capital. Fundraising OSS company in and some companies called Unicode already. And the Chinese uh, fund focused on open source. Because uh, we, uh, Kai Vencha and Rose Kaiser members, sense for the business. If the proprietary software from China, how to make the market to work? Very, very, very hard. Uh, extremely uh, hard. That the uh, open source, open standard from China, more easy to go into the grow. And uh, many Chinese companies not need the fee from IP, we need the more developed standard, we need the more developed uh, building together. That's the uh, reason why China government and the Chinese uh, company focus on more and more open source. This is most of the important slide in my share uh, from a UK capital Chinese VC. They told uh, current of open source 3.0 era for the business. The beginning of open source, open source 0.0, is a typical software is a GNA and Linux. Almost no business model, but just for fun. I really like to just for fun. And also just to change the society. This is the most primary important on the parts. And the second one, RAM, Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP era. Building the software, uh, building the solution, building the service by only open source software and uh, doing the same business as the software development. This era is uh, almost the same as the normal company. Use for free, support for the pay is a version of 1.0. And version 2.0, the software as a service era, cloud era, confluent, Kafka. These are uh, makes community a uh, better, makes uh, software as a service better, uh, makes for good service by the community. This is a very uh, good way from Apache Software Foundation, they saw the community over code. Makes good community, they contribute and renew the software a lot. That's the reason why we pay the fee for the software as a service. Then now, newest one, open source software 3.0, uh, like uh, MongoDB, Databricks, also GitHub and TiDB. This is uh, not just a cloud native, always uh, open source software, uh, just a platform as a service model. Scalable, distributed, cloud service business model, uh, almost all solution is open source. Very hard to find a problem. But we still pay for the software. Currently, community is most important. How developing the software is most important. Proprietary or uh, open source is not so important. If you make a global community, if you make a big developing power, if you can hire a million engineer, you can do the proprietary. But very hard. Google also uh, sometimes doing the open source because Google people are also very clever. Google is brilliant engineers there, but they know although Google is much, much better. <laughs> That's the reason why they're choosing the open source. And also the community side, we, uh, our community is still growing. Uh, Open Infra Foundation uh, is a global community. Platinum member is far away, Tencent Cloud, and the group Alibaba. We are working together with Sony, Ericsson, Facebook, Windows, Red Hat, Microsoft. In the open source side, Western people and the Eastern people working together to make a platform. Probably Open Infra Foundation uh, the real purpose is uh, making a very good cloud software expect us. And uh, many projects from China, incubation by Linux Foundation, Apache Software Foundation, Cloud Native Foundation. Last year, Linux, Linux Foundation makes uh, 15 projects incubate already. That 15 projects is all coming from China. And also Open Foundation was there. This is a uh, power by Tongo Dongfu Gongxingbe, the China government supported the Open Source Foundation. They are official foundation. They can make the regulation, they can make the law for the open source in China. And uh, they build the license, integrate open source software from China, and push open source culture from the government, and for the university and the company, and make the law support in open source. This is one of the examples from the Open uh, Atom Foundation. They make the new license, Mulan uh, software, Mulan software license version 2, Mulan PSL. 
this is almost similar to the crisis, but more uh, China friendly. Uh, because of uh, in China, uh, some system is a uh, different group the United States. This is software, uh, this is license is a uh, good for the Chinese society. And uh, also dual language, both English and Chinese compatible. This is license purpose means makes contract from Chinese company to overseas company using the same same license for the open source. This license is a uh, initiative or uh, authorized already the open source initiative approved. And uh, we Chinese making a new one for the GTL style uh, license for China. And also open source hardware style. I was like, well known Chinese uh, style copy cap called Shanzai. When a China company makes a lot of copy. But uh, this Shanzai style is transforming now to the Gonka. Uh, later, Baniba uh, will come into each other this way. Uh, this two words is an uh, idea from Baniba. New Shanzai engineers and entrepreneurs are helping the China tech clients such as Xiaomi, Oppo, uh, and the Hacking Air Robot. I try to explain about that where the Shanzai comes from and where the Shanzai happened what. Shanzai means Chinese style open source hardware, but design shape, not the being based on license. That is why open source. Open source. Um, we share the design, we share the, the sometimes we share the hardware and we share the IP. This is a function is similar as open source, but not based on license. Current Chinese company is uh, focused for transforming share IP, share product, share knowledge, but based on open source license. Currently, more than 50% of risk five premium members are from China. Current China is the most popular risk five country in the world. Uh, you can see some Chinese companies there. The biggest one is the key head of, uh, is the best of Alibaba. They sold more 2.5 billion of chips by this to my best. And uh, if you have the true wireless earphone there, in that earphone price under $10, keep from China, Shenzhen, Jerry or Blue Trans. These two companies are very uh, huge advocate for the risk part. Currently, this file is a common already. If you bought the Bluetooth chips under ten Singapore dollars, probably this file is from China. And you know there's the chip design company T has shipped out of two point five billion of this file chips. They are more open source, no any Shanghai was there. And uh, less than ten dollars Bluetooth chips and Bluetooth earphone and Bluetooth speaker. Uh, some kind of pilot about uh, Bluetooth IP, but uh, chipset IP is a purely uh, risk file. Our company, Sweet Science, uh, is an uh, uh, open source hardware market. We, ours, uh, we sold a lot of Raspberry Pi, Arduino, and uh, M5 stack, ESP32, also PSR. Many open source hardware, risk file chips, servers, and sensors from China day by day. I started the business from China from 2014. 2014's kind of hardware is okay, compatible, even cheaper than other. But uh, now the Chinese ha hardware from start from China, I never know yet. I never saw yet new style of technology from China, like uh, AI ASIC model and also uh, one chip SOC inside a lot of functions. Shanghai transforming to the public now, day by day. In this uh, this uh, system, uh, this uh, IoT development of uh, hardware is uh, called the M5 stack. ESP32 based uh, in screen and battery. There is a market is uh, currently bigger than Arduino in Japan. Thanks for the attention. Uh, we uh, currently uh, this uh, activity in post Asia is uh, very good for the uh, and memorial for the Kaiwencha. Three Chinese open source committee want more and more contribute to the world of uh, open source community. We start from running. We use it a lot of open source. And currently, we want to commitment and contribute for the world of open source society. We think uh, more and more commitment to the next year and also not only in Singapore but other societies. Marjorie Singapore, Marjorie Open Source Society.
。最強若見、ありがとうございました。Thank you very much for your talk.、Um, does any of the audience like to ask、um, questions? Do you want to go back here? You want to go back here? You know, I'm a best known Japanese. My mother is Japanese. <laughs> Excuse me. Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, you talked about something、uh, in Chinese, which is an alternative to upper chat voice, right? So, what is the difference between upper chat voice in which you talked about? The difference between the two,、uh, the Chinese version of upper chat voice and upper chat voice. Oh, okay.、Uh, your question is what the difference society or the social investment side or economic side, right? Yeah. Of course, almost similar. Almost similar. But.、Uh, I know,、uh, in my analogy, almost all open source license is based on United States. Even、uh, we buy in the contract, we have to bring that to the US court. So, like、uh, in Singapore, I keep an eye on the license, but you say you are out of the license, very hard to、uh, solve that contract. If we need to、uh, uh, solve the contract, we have to go to the US court. But in Chinese banner is a quarter in China. Thank you. Not the Chinese government support the open source. They not need a Chinese official open source, but they need open source for the Chinese government. Oh, I was just wondering.、Um, you mentioned a lot about government、uh, involvement. How is the Chinese government approaching open source different to other governments around the world? I think China is a more developing centrist by the government. If the China society need open source, China government have to push it. And most of big things is spread the world. If the closed door secret from China, very hard to sell in all over the world. I thought the my company is China's market is only in Japan. Uh, our customer is Japanese.、Uh, they even my solution is proprietary. Very hard to sell from China. But the open source hardware from China is okay. That、uh, that company Pitcap also. The Pitcap is a some、uh, American company Square and the Japanese payment company PayPay also using the no no Pitcap. Ah, okay, okay. Uh, American payment company Square, and、uh, Japanese payment company PayPay also using the Thai DB from China.、Uh, but、uh, that means open source is different for the business. Hi, I'm Kilo. My question is more about what do you think the Japan open source community can learn from, from what、uh, Paris is doing in China? I left from Japan around ten years before. I had that there was that level. Still, the Japanese love open source. Japanese love the open source society and still doing the contribution. But、uh, most of the problem of Japanese society, the Finnish and Finnish guys and government is very very far. You know, if you not do a not do any contribution, you definitely can't understand the open source. Government guys trying to do the code to the laboratory.、Uh, Most important to run in the open source. In here, Singapore and China is better things because many business guys, many government guys, more open source and do open source and well. In Japan, doing side and thinking and design side very very far. This is the largest problem in Japan. I also want to solve that problem. That I need to advocate open source in the whole world. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Takasu, and we're looking forward to the other section here at the event. Thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Makasi ya. Okay, I just now over my laptop. Thank you for coming. And please enjoy together for the first day after three days.
Thank you.